Stop doing three sets of 12 to build muscle and do this instead. You guys want to guess? Stop doing the three sets of 12 and do this instead. Mm -hmm. uh, with that intro, my guess is you're going to tell people to change the rep range five up to, five. yeah, five oh. by five or low rep range. Do you is guys that, remember yeah, when you're going? Yeah. So um, oftentimes we get stuck in like a set count and a rep count or a range that's kind of similar, like eight to 12, right? Three sets tends to be the norm. And oftentimes we don't challenge that. Um, and, or think that that has any profound effect if we do challenge that. And I remember the first time, I, I guarantee you guys have a similar story. I remember the first time that I went outside of that and was blown away at the progress that I made. One of the first times I did this was, uh, I've told this story before, I had a trainer who used to practice bench press. At the t back in the days, like when we were kids in the 90s, Bench press was the exercise, right? If you were, if, if somebody wanted to ask you how strong you were, mm -hmm. the question was like, how much could you bench? So it was like an important exercise to for your ego. And I remember I had this trainer that worked for me who was just really, had this really strong bench press. And I used to notice him go out to the floor and he would do like one or two reps on the bench press. Um, and he would do this kind of throughout the day or whatever. And I thought, is that, is that how he's getting so strong? And I asked him, he said, oh, yeah. Said, Since I started doing something like that, I got so strong. So at that point, I started practicing um, my lifts where I would do, instead of three sets of 10 or 12 or even six, I would do like six or seven sets of one. Mm. So I'd, I'd go into a workout, I'd load a bar, work my way up, warm up, and then I'd do one rep. And it wasn't a max, it was heavy, but it wasn't my max. And then I would do like seven sets of one rep. And my strength gains absolutely exploded above and beyond anything I'd experienced before. That was my first time really going, oh, uh, there's something to training in different rep ranges. Um, it's not just about the exercises. The rep ranges themselves actually make a difference. Oh, I had to learn that lesson about five times. <laughs> and <laughs> the guess because you did one and then you thought that that's was exactly all the right. different so versions. The, this is how, this is, I mean, looking back, I think like, how stupid was I, right? Um, but like the typical young teenager early 20s in pursuit of building muscle and getting bigger um you know i was constantly reading articles and and uh you know asking every gym bro i could get you know talk to what should i do what do i did this i mean i was i was in search of what what i need to do and i remember uh originally i was a six six rep guy because at that time whatever mass was yeah six rep. yeah yeah that yeah. was like to build mass and size uh that's what i had read and so that's where i was at and i was there for probably years and then it was the uh this bodybuilder guy that was just incredible shape and i saw him doing like these real light like bicep curls like hella reps and i was just looking at him like dude this dude is jacked and he's like i i curl more than what he's curling right now this can't be like so i remember asking him and he was a trainer and he, he's in, he was probably a, a decent trainer because his response back to me, he asked me, well, what are you doing? And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I always do this, this. And he's like, oh, he's like, bro, you got to lift, you know, 15 to 20 reps. And I'm like, oh, I don't, I don't want to get tone. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not trying to get tone, bro. I'm trying to get jacked. He's yeah. like, yeah, no, this is going to grow your arms more than that. So then I went and did that. And then sure as shit, boom, I broke through this plateau and saw some gains I'd never seen. So then I was like, oh my God, it's 15 to 20 reps. It's not six. What was I doing? I was doing the wrong thing forever. There, same thing, going forever. Then I read somewhere else, like the benefits of what true hypertrophy is. That's 10 to 12 rep range. I'm like, oh shit. So it's somewhere in the middle. I was doing that wrong. <laughs> so I go there. Sure enough, again, what happens? Boom, breakthrough plateau. I'm like, Classic. oh my God, this is it. So I stuck there for another year or so. Yeah. And it wasn't until, I, I really think until after that and you know, getting the advice of going back the other directions that I realized like, oh, the, the secret sauce in this is, and, and I, I guess- at that time in my life, and I'm even a young trainer at this point, I don't really fully grasp uh, adaptation and how the body adapts to something and then how novelty changes that so much. Like, right, I understood like these rep ranges, but I didn't realize that it doesn't matter how good this rep range may be for me building muscle. If I've been doing that for eight, 10, 12, you know, weeks or longer that almost any other rep range is going to stimulate building muscle yeah. and building growth than that one. And so that was kind of finally when I pieced that together, like, Oh, this is the problem is I don't, I need to always be kind of manipulating through, which is probably what led me to the next 
problem that I ran into, which is like, oh, muscle confusion. Fucking yeah. Yeah. Now, oh now I'm doing all the rep ranges, all the different exercises and every different workout. And again, saw some good results from that, right? I all of a sudden throw this curveball at my body. Every, different exercise yeah, every time. Every workout was, I used to, literally, that was, I prided myself on saying that, like, I've never repeated a workout once. Yeah. They're always, like, I thought that was like a cool, good thing. You know what I'm saying? That's how much I'm, like, dedicated to confusing my muscles, right? <laughs> so I'm changing the reps. I'm changing the exercises. And initially, when I did that, of course, I saw a change in gain. Like, it was a oh, yeah. novel stimulus. And then eventually hit that plateau. And then I, again, realized, like, oh, okay, there's, there's a more methodical approach to this that I need to apply that I had never applied before. And then it really, and by the way, this whole journey, um, you know, I've openly shared too, like in my twenties, I, I was doing steroids and doing whatever thing I could to, to, to gain muscle and, you know, little plateau breaks, a little bit of muscle here and there. I really started to gain, build, change my physique, have that cover of a magazine look way later. And the answer wasn't all the different things I tried, anabolics and supplements and stuff like that. It really was understanding programming and nutrition. That's it. Like yeah. once that all come full circle for me and I really grasped how important yeah. it was to know how to program workouts and how important it was to be consistent with the diet, especially with protein intake, that was when, oh my God, now I could do almost anything with my physique. I want yeah. you want to be big jack guy? Do I want to be lean and shredded? Do I want to be someone that, like then I could control all that. It had nothing to do with all the drugs and shit that I tried. Yeah, I just leaned completely in uh the strength phases forever. Like as I was it was a very competitive environment because it was very much me against uh, my friends who were on the same team yeah. as me. And so we would all train together and it was like, you'd split off into groups and it was like, who could lift the most at each one of these core lifts. And that's all I cared about. I didn't care about like it, you know, the process to get me strong. I'm just like, I'm going to keep testing and try, you know, the next week, keep adding five, keep adding five, keep adding. And that was it. And it was like, it ranged from five reps to 10. And that was as much as I would possibly do as 10 reps. And I did that forever until finally, probably even like out of high school, I started to kind of, you know, venture into like the 12 to 15 to 20 rep range. And it just absolutely destroyed me. Yeah. I remember it was like, it was even when uh, I was working for Adam, when I first kind of, when I graduated, I came back, I'd never done uh super setting. And then you introduced me to that. And it was like an addiction after that because it just felt, I was like, oh my God, my muscles feel like so tight. I couldn't, couldn't walk. <laughs> and I was like, dude, what is this? And I wanted to figure it out. I like, could do that with my legs too. And, uh, and so it was like, I get all these new gains and all the stuff. I got addicted to that. But yeah, you just got to weave back and, and figure out like they all have benefit to There's it. There's an old saying in, in strength training. I think it's a bodybuilding saying, uh, but it says, um, most things work, Until. nothing works forever. Oh, yeah. 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 And I, it's a, such a true statement. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the confusion around this also has to do with the studies around rep ranges because yeah. they can confuse people quite a bit. That's so, why. Yeah, because you'll see a 16-week a study or a 12-week study, and what they'll do in these studies is they'll compare rep ranges, and they'll take groups of young men, usually college-aged males, and they'll compare you know three to six reps, mm -hmm. eight to 12 reps, and 15 to 20 reps. And they'll have them train for 16 weeks or 12 weeks. At the end of the study, they'll measure uh, muscle hypertrophy, and then they'll, the report will come out, and it'll say eight to 12 eight reps 12 is, is superior. That's gospel now for muscle growth. Yeah. But here's what a lot of people don't realize: is all of those rep ranges grew muscle. They all did, and yep. there is no year or two year or three year long study. It's too expensive. But if they did that, here's what you would find. That eight to twelve reps would are great until it stopped in this window, yeah. and then they'd have to switch to another rep range. And the people that understand switching rep ranges at the right time, knowing when to switch exercises at the right time and which ones not to switch, those are the people that make uh, all the progress. But again, when, when people look at those studies, and this is what I love to tell trainers of mine that work for me later on when I understood this, they'd say, "Oh." But the study says eight to 12 reps builds the most muscle. I'd say, but they built muscle on one rep too. They also built muscle on 20 reps. Yeah. So why would we neglect those rep ranges, especially when that, that eight to 12 stops working? When it stops working, you have a, a magic button you can push and it literally is change the rep range. By the way, novelty, and you you touched on this, Adam, when people think confuse the muscles, and I, I blame this on on fitness advertising, right? There was, a, I don't remember what company it was that sold a fitness program. P90X. That's what it was. Like yeah. muscle confusion. It was like this mm -hmm. big thing that they sold. 
And really what it turned into was how many weird exercises <laughs> yeah, can yeah, you do? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Novelty, I felt, I felt novelty could be tempo. It could be rest period. That's right. It could be tension points of an exercise. It could be an isometric or a pause in the rep. It could be rep count. It could be set count. It could be how many days a week you work out. How many rest periods. How many, yeah, it, I mean, all of those things yeah. contribute to novelty. It's not just the weirdest exercise you could do and how many you can do them. It's all those things. So if you're doing a workout right now that consists of four exercises and that's all you ever do and you're doing six reps of those, you know what's novel? 10 reps of those yeah. exact same exercises yeah. now becomes novel. Yeah, yeah. All those things changes. The, you know, the biggest problem with those studies that is like I wish people understood is that if we if we actually had a study that showed this, okay, uh, we have, for six weeks, this group all did 8 to 12. We the, the, the last study told us that 8 to 12 is best for hypertrophy. Now let's take those people that did 8 to 12 for six weeks consistently. Now let's extend them another six weeks of still staying at 8 to 12, and then we'll take another group or a half of that group and change them to one or change them to 20 reps right. and then just compare who did better. And what you'll see is the group that did 8 to 12 originally and then changed right. will see even more gains than the, the group that stayed 8 to 12 for the entire right. six-week and six-week study. Like that's what we're missing. With yes. That. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna say this as well because you'll often hear bodybuilders talk about higher rep ranges and how they like to train in higher rep ranges. And and I'll tell you why that is. Uh, it's mainly because when you start to get really strong and really big, one of the things that you have to factor in when you're factoring all the different things is uh, risk of injury. So when you're a bodybuilder and if you're training for three reps, well now all of a sudden you're you're squatting with 500 plus pounds or bench pressing with 400 plus pounds, it's probably at that point, because of the risk of injury, smarter to go higher rep. That's all. Because if your form is off by three degrees with a 600 pound squat, like that could hurt you, right? With a 300 pound squat, you're not. You're probably not going to get hurt. So all that's what they have to take into consideration. But if, if you're the average person, especially if it's like the first three years of your training, like all those rep ranges are amazing. And those low rep ranges, I'll tell you a secret right now uh, that you guys don't know this. You guys know this. So it's not a secret, but for the audience, the first program that we created was MAPS Anabolic. The reason why I started MAPS Anabolic with the first phase of MAPS Anabolic as a low rep phase is pre precisely because I know, and I mean low rep range, five reps or less. The reason why I did that is because I know the vast majority of people who would buy this yeah, wouldn't do that. never trained yeah, yeah. in yeah. that rep range. And what I wanted to show them, especially women, because I knew that. I said, if I could capture the female consumer, this program is going to crush. And I knew if I if I could show them in the first phase crazy gains, they're going to follow the rest of the program. Yep. That's why I put that as phase one. Because to be honest with you, it doesn't matter. Phase three starts first or whatever. But I started with phase one precisely because I know it would show so many people crazy results because nobody ever trains in that. I think, I think there's another reason, too, why um, bodybuilders really uh, lean more towards the high rep, uh, high rep range, too. It, because they're also in the business of sculpting and how strong they are is irrelevant to how their body looks. And one of the things that can get away from you when you're always pushing strength is uh, targeting a part of the yeah, body. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, when you do a max lift on a deadlift or a squat or a movement, like yeah. it, you don't really care if the, the chest got a little bit more involved in that shoulder press yeah. than the shoulder. Like, but when you're when you're bodybuilding, body sculpting, um, you are you're separating the body parts. You're looking at an area that you're like, I just want to work this, and it's a lot easier to target an area, control a weight with a lighter weight for more reps than it is to move something five times really, really heavy and then also only hit but that. But again, especially if you're really strong, Adam, because even pro bodybuilders will even go substantially lighter with compound basic lifts. And it's because, again, like if you're a power lifter, you have to train heavy because that's what you're going to do. You're going to go compete. But you're a pro bodybuilder. I mean, Ronnie Coleman was famous for you know doing 800-pound squats and, and, I mean, he injured himself terribly. Like when you get really strong, I do this now, and I'm nowhere near as strong as Ronnie Coleman, but uh, I do this now where I, I often will see if I can make an exercise feel hard with lighter weight. Yeah. Not because there's no value in going heavy, but because the risk of injury with my form is off a little bit is just too high now. It, it just doesn't make any sense for me to see if I could go past 500 pounds on a squat or 
or whatever because just the, the yeah. risk versus reward is well. I mean, if we're factor. if we're using bodybuilders as the great example for this conversation, I mean, Dexter Jackson is the is the example of the guy. No who, injuries. Yeah, no injuries, and has been training that way yep. for his entire. But I bet you he went real heavy in his early days. Maybe young trainer. Yeah, he's maybe. I mean, De he's been this way though for. A, I mean, how how old is Dexter Jackson? Well, he now was, he's got his fifty something, and he's still like I, he. I was, don't think he competes anymore. I think it, he finally retired. Did he finally retire? Yeah. I mean, he just retired not that long yeah, ago yeah. with like no injuries and. One of the one of the most amazing physiques, and uh, I know that's like oh yeah one, the bodybuilders one of his claim Germany. one of his claims to fame is that he's like not the guy who lifts super heavy weight at all no that's that's those are the smart the bodybuilders that still train still look amazing they they understood that because uh, fifty four years old he's with, and I think he retired at forty seven or something like that if I'm not mistaken did he I, dude no way I think he he was bro he was still competing in his fifties. Really? Oh yes. He, I know he still looks good. If you look him up now, he still looks incredible. Yeah, let, let me let me And he's on it. TRT doses now. I know he dropped his uh 2020. 2020. So, so 4 years ago. So four, wow, so he's 50. Yeah, he was 50 years old. So wow. he still competed at 50. Yeah. At, I, I, I I Mr. Olympia too. Not like I competed, right? There's a lot of guys that are older than 50. There was another bodybuilder. I shared it with you, Doug. I, and there's no way I can remember his name now. He's in his 60s 22 now. year bodybuilding career. That's yeah. so impressive. Wow. Yeah. Oh yeah, longevity with that. If Five time Arnold Classic, two thousand eight Mr. Olympia. Look at that. Holding the record for the most professional wins with yeah, twenty nine. I know. That and they're it's just smart training. You gotta be smart at some point. You know what I mean? Where you just stop chasing I mean it's it, it also highlight why I love to use someone like that as an example because there again, there's a lot of there's the studies for training to failure, right? People have yeah. this. There's a lot of clips going around um in our with our peers talking about the importance of training intensity and pressing that level mm -hmm. and it's just like i mean it's part of my motivation right now with how you see me training is like i'm really trying to to exemplify this example of like i'm gonna build a fucking pretty sick physique right now and you haven't seen me the highest i, I squatted the other day the most i've squatted at 205 mm. and it's the heaviest of any weight i've touched i'm a deadlift today maybe 185 i mean you're talking light light weight for what i can normally move and I'm going to show you in a month's time how much of a transformation my yeah. physique. So it's the the answer is not in this, you know, pushing to the next level intensity. I feel like those conversations are communicating to these people that have been training for 15 years consistently, hard plateau, and it's like here's the things to break through these plateaus. The average person that is can't be has not been consistent for one year of their life of training mm -hmm. in the gym does not need to utilize some of these tools that are seen, that are communicated so much. Just to back you up, yeah. uh, there's some data that shows that the average sedentary individual, it was a study, they did, I think, one isometric contraction three days a week. I saw that. And they yeah. saw dramatic improvements. Yeah. 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 Muscle gain from that. Yeah, yeah, dude. pretty crazy. Because they're, so, they're, they're normally so sedentary. Yeah. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps, that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Speaking of you, Adam, you made a comment on the last podcast that was incorrect. I need to, oh. I need to correct you. <laughs> yeah, we're well, doing a little fact checking. Well, so he made I a I'm comment. Fact check him now. I, so. I look on sometimes I look on YouTube comments, which is dumb oh dear God, why you do that to yourself? The YouTube audience is hilarious. But anyway, you said that that Kamala Harris went from being the most unpopular vice president ever to all of a sudden, you know, being popular and, you know, whatever. That's not true? No, she was not the most unpopular president. Really? Uh, vice president ever. She was third most unpopular <laughs> president. <laughs> the Dude, most- Who the, beat her out? The yeah. most unfavorable uh, VP of all time was Dan, was Quayle, uh, then Cheney, Cheney, and then Harris at 58% in September 2023. So- Indeed, extremely unpopular. I didn't know that. D Dick but Cheney's not, voting for Harris, though. That's great. That's a that is not the endorsement. I <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? <laughs> yeah. Promoting that yeah. like Hitler comes I out. Like, I support. Scratching my head <laughs> on that one. I'm like, I know. yeah. I, I, I do. I can't even watch her clips, dude. I can't watch her. Her clips are so. It's so ridiculous. I can't watch almost any politician. It's, yeah, they it's just cringe. Can't, I, just yeah. can't do it. I can't believe you say that. I mean, I that's I I, it's just it makes me upset because what's happened is when you watch a debate 
uh, what you realize is the game. The name of the game is the the soundbite. The clip. Yes. So it's really not about the content of the debate. It's not trying to like really be intelligent and and answer the question. It's about to deliver it. How can I wedge in? It doesn't a, matter. A gotcha soundbite because yeah. that's what goes viral. I, I will. The, the fact checking happens later. What I do like that I'm seeing in politics right now, which is very very little, or that I like. What I do think is we're in this interesting transition. And the I do think that the old way, these debates, these televised with the moderators that nobody likes, no one seems to be happy, whatever side you're on with how they do things, to these uh, presidential candidates starting to do podcasts, long form, yep. not prepped yep. conversations. Uh, I just saw Ramsey did Trump uh, just recently. I know Vivek has gone around and did his whole tour. Yeah. To me, like now we're going to start getting that more authentic, like real conversation. That isn't canned. They aren't prepared with questions. It's not like a, a layup. It's actual people that are having... And boy, I tell you what, you can't... Like, good luck with uh, how well you prepare for something like that because you, you, you're, not, you're, you're not getting the same setup that you are right now. Unless with the they capture the podcaster. That's the that's always the question. Sure, and there's going to be those. Yeah. I'm sure they're going to have a handful of layup podcasts that, yeah. they, that they go on and that they can do that. But I think if it's if if the same candidates are going on like the the Rogans, the Ramseys, the different I mean, people, that's like, been a little one sided. Well, it's yeah. very one sided right now. It seems to be Trump is the only one doing that <laughs> yeah, right he's now. The only one doing it. Uh, I mean. Kamala was on Oprah. That was about. I saw Kamala do one with Stephen Jackson and um, I forget what, what's his name, the other basketball player. So there's two two basketball players that have this podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, very much so, kind of layup. They were trying to to help think, her, but still was terrible. Brett Weinstein, I think it was Brett Weinstein, said this, uh, and I, I I agree. I've agreed with this for a long time. I think what you have is you have these these huge huge mega donors and players with way more influence than than we do okay just tons and tons of influence and what they do is they they create the false illusion of choice so what they do is they make it so that the candidates on either side they're okay with it's like hedging their bets yeah it's like well we want to make sure that we that this guy on the right is the one that gets that get that's the one that could potentially get elected and then this is the person we want on the left to potentially get elected that way if either one of them wins we win. Yeah. Now, where's my evidence? My evidence is look how the each side destroys candidates that don't fit that yeah. that don't fit that narrative. Yeah. I remember when Bernie Sanders started getting really popular yeah. uh, as a, as a as a Democrat, and I'm not a fan of Bernie Sanders, but boy, did the way that they systematically destroyed oh, him they snubbed yeah. him out really crazy, right? Yeah. And you see this on both sides. I remember on the right uh, did that with Ron Paul. I remember Ron uh -huh. Paul uh, was right this was a long time ago. And I remember his his delegates were on the bus to vote, and they prevented the bus from actually getting to the place to vote. And they were tweeting <laughs> like, "They won't let us pull over." Like, what's going on? Yeah, I'm like, oh, you bastards! You well, know? I mean, Ross Perot just spent all that money just so he could have like that moment to shine. <laughs> <laughs> he had to spend a ton of money for that. But uh, yeah, there's uh, never been a real dude, third party. We're here though, dude. It's uh, this is the October surprise month, there's right? Be so many so, surprises. So what's uh, what's going to happen, bro? You're I, normally the predictor of this I, stuff I, for us. You know, that's why it's called a surprise. I, don't know. I hope but, it's not World War Three. Oh I mean, God, no, don't say it's that. It's ramping up. Did you see speaking of politics? Did you, did you so? Our Arthur Brooks was on Max Lugavere's podcast and he brought up some data. So Matt, so um, Arthur Brooks is I a, love Arthur Brooks. He's a happiness scientist, essentially. Like he studies this. He's a professor on the subject. What makes people happy? What makes them unhappy? Uh, understands human Is behavior. he still teaching at Harvard or is he no longer teaching? I don't teaching think there? so. No. Um, but a really smart guy. Uh, I love the way he communicates things. And, and Max brought up an article that he had written in The Atlantic and it talked about from a, from a political perspective the most and least happiest people. So the the happiest group within that context were conservative women, followed shortly by conservative men, and then liberal men were the least happy, and then uh, liberal women now, now, data shows, are the least, least happy. Yeah. So of those groups, liberal women, I think he, the data he quoted was Five six out of 10 out of them, six out of 10 liberal women uh, suffer or diagnosed with a mental health disorder and suffer from and only like depression. if I re recall that clip I saw that clip it was like only five percent of them even report happiness being happy I don't remember that it was one. like a crazy low number I don't remember but it was really and you know he's there's a lot of speculation uh, around this as to why that might be the case do you guys think it's a like the cause and effect is one way or the other you know what I mean like do they vote that way I, because I think, they're unhappy or is that a, is that are the policies and agendas of that 
what a, make a them unhappy. Of that? Or yeah. do they, they, I or think, is I think there was a big movement just after our generation. And it became a thing that people would start to say that they want to do for a career and a living. Which and I forget where I first saw this or read this. And I thought this was really interesting. And I think it, it actually uh, uh, shines a little bit of light on what uh, you're, you're bringing up right now. And that there's like this movement of when I grow up, I want to be an activist. Oh. Mm. And man, when, if, if, that, if you decide that that's going to be your thing, when you don't even know what that thing you're going to be an activist about, like it could become a really uh, negative way to view the world. No matter what, what you're going to be Especially an activist. Especially if that's what you worship. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. So if you decide that I'm going to be a you know, pro-animal activist. Well, your focus is all what's wrong. That's right. Yeah. So your, your entire lens that you look at the world through is all the bad things yeah. we do to animals. And so then you, so I, I can only imagine how if you, and there's a whole generation of kids that decided that, that this is what they want to do. Like they are all seeking a thing to be an activist about. And when you are that activist, you tend to look through the lens of all the negative things that's happening to whatever th cause you're deciding to support. That can be a really, uh, ugh, yeah. way to look at society oh yeah take on a lot of that energy. and i and i and i bet you know, that has a lot to do one of the keys to depression uh is to learn about problems you cannot influence yeah uh because it feels hopeless and helpless i so i have a, i have a different i have a i have a theory here's my theory maybe i'm wrong but if you look at the extreme sides of each each of those uh let's say agendas i don't know lack of a better term right like things that they promote right Mm. And you look at that like liberal women's side and you look at some of the extremes things that they promote culturally, it's um, uh, promiscuous sex is liberating. Children are oppressive burden uh, and a burden. Marriage is oppressive. At least traditional marriage is oppressive. Masculinity is toxic. Um, and, and I think those things, well, I don't think the data shows the opposite to be true, promiscuous sex leads to anxiety and depression and lack of purpose. Marriage makes you happier and gives you purpose. Children do the same thing. Um, uh, and so I think I think that may be part of the problem. I think that part of the problem is either people fall in that category or believe in that so much. I mean, if you, if you take what I think and what you think and you combine them, I think it's just yeah. a recipe for that. Yeah. I mean, you take all those things and then you, so you, you're, you're, nay, way, you're, nay, you're nay on, on being celibate or having one, one, one monogamous relationship or getting married. You don't yeah. want to have kids. And then you decide to be an activist about something in the world. Yeah. Like, boy, it just sounds like a recipe for a, a fucking really yeah, rough, a rough go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of, and that a lot of angry Karens. And that masculinity is somehow toxic. Traditional masculinity is somehow toxic, which, uh, it's, it's not. You need it. Uh, the data, by the way, is just very clear on this. By the way, this is the popular cultural message to a lot of women. The ones that really bother me the most that I'm really with, careful with my daughters is the whole, like, it's liberating to be, it's liberating to be promiscuous. Okay. That's not liberating. Uh, it's actually steals from your soul. This is true for men, by the way, as well. Uh, but definitely uh, for women. And having children is a burden. What a terrible message. You know, it's really you would, interesting. You would communicate to anybody. It's really interesting from... Uh, By the way, I wish my... I want my daughters, I hope they, they fall in love with and marry a good man with traditional masculinity. Why? Because I want her to be protected. I want her to be cared for. And I want uh, someone to help lead the household because that is a burden... That, uh, that 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 the mother who's already got burdened by the tremendous care of her children shouldn't have. She should also she should have somebody take some of that off of her. So that's what I would hope. You know, Katrina and I have been together for over thirteen years now, and you know, it's it's an interesting thing for her and I to to discuss now that we have a child together, and we've been together for that long. And it was a topic that. Didn't really get talked a lot about uh, early on in the relationship. It's definitely not one of those things that like, it's like you know, starting off on religion, politics with any relationship is probably not the, the best way to, to start a conversation. And so she grew up in a matriarch. Yeah. I mean, that, the, I mean, Tina runs the whole family from top, top down. And you even see how every woman is married in that, in that household or through that. And Katrina has a lot of those attributes that come from somebody who's been, who's been uh, raised that way. And a lot of things I think are are beautiful and strong. I mean, I have a very independent, um, capable, strong, strong woman. Um, but I think it's taken us till we're forty something years old, and we've seen all the other girls that are now in our that are nieces that are in their late twenties, early thirties, 
and seeing the challenges they are having in dating and relationships and, and coming up in this world. And I think it's only recently in the last few years has Katrina really connected the dots. Uh, and some of that too is because Tina has come forward and even said that, like, I'm so sorry I, what I what I did, you know, she thought I was, she thought she was doing the right thing. I want to I don't want my women to yeah. my my girls to depend on a man, and they want I want them to be self sufficient, and I want and like the because of what hurt what she went through, right? Yeah. So she her goal and was thinking of all the girls that she's going to raise, like they're going to be these strong women that don't need men, and um, I think it was came from a, a good place in love, but didn't see the unintended consequences of teaching. Uh, uh, your girls that, hey, you don't need a man. You don't want, you know, you want to be able to do this and do that on your own and you shouldn't need need a man. And I think there's uh, there's nothing wrong with a woman needing a man and a man needing a woman. I mean, I think- I think that's one of the biggest yeah. lies that we teach people is that you don't need anybody. No, we oh. need each other. Yeah. That's just a fact. It's just like, a shared experience. We yeah. need each other. Yeah, and, right and left brain. Yeah, I, mean, I, I love using that as an example. It's like there's different- um, you know, functions, there's different responsibilities, different ways of perspectives, uh, and it all blends really well together. And, and that's the thing is it enriches uh, everything if you include somebody into that. Yeah. And, and it gives you, you know, a much broader perspective that's helpful. Apply that lie anywhere. Apply in sports. I don't need my teammates. Yeah. Uh, business. Exactly. I don't need nobody. You know, you know, marriage. I don't need my spouse. You know, I don't need my kids. I don't need my my friends. You I don't turn need to a selfish asshole. You're dead. You're dead. You yeah. need, we need each other. And even if you found a way to get by, it's you, that's a different. You're, I'm you're not talking so about much functional. You, yeah, you're me, so but. much better with someone. Totally. Yeah. It's like uh, there's there's no doubt in my mind. Listen, there was no doubt in my mind that by myself I was going to find my way. I was going. I was not going to be poor and struggle. I I knew that there was no, but there's no way that I'm at where I'm at in my life if I don't have her as my partner. There's no way. There's no way. I've I reached the level of where I'm at had I not found a teammate and a partner in life that was going to bring that best version. And boy, it's really hard to when if you have this attitude of you don't need the other person. And it was you know it used to be a thing that Katrina would even say that like I, I don't need you. I want you. And that was something that she used to like really pride herself on saying. And it wasn't until way later in a relationship she goes, you know what? That's so, to... so wrong. <laughs> that it's so wrong that I used to say that. Opposite. I said, yeah, it is the opposite. She goes, I absolutely need you. And I also want you to feel that I need you. Mm -hmm. Like that idea was so crazy that I thought that that was the right way to live, live my life and go about it. And again, we now see that manifesting in the younger generation that's growing up now that has grown in this matriarch. And now we're really, really struggling to find a partner. And you're talking about beautiful, strong, fit, successful women that are having a real hard time finding a, a mate because of the way they have viewed mm -hmm. marriage and partnerships and relationships. And now they're getting to this place where it's like so crazy that you have this 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 girl who is incredible, has so much going for her, and yet still has a hard time finding a partner. And it's like, well... You know I don't why think we were meant to operate that way. It's scary, right? It's scary to be like, yeah, I need these people. I need this thing. It's scary, but yeah, you got to be vulnerable. That's, you have to. It's really hard. You have to. You're going to miss out on everything. Well, you said this the other day. I don't know if it was on air or not, but one of the things you're learning in your your class that you're going through with marriage is that, you know, biblically we, we we're meant to serve the other person. Yep. Do you know what the, like that really flips that all on its head right there? Absolutely. Like, I, I mean, imagine you're not supposed to go into it with what are my needs? What, yeah. Why? What can no. you provide? It's like, what can I do for you? And when you look at really happy old couples, that's what they. It's like they they almost like compete for who can serve the other person uh, better. So you tend to find it. Well, when you and when you learn to foster that in your relationship, it's unbelievable what it does. It's it, and when you find a good partner that has the same value, it does become a competition. It does become a like trying to level up on each other of like doing doing things for each other. It's a beautiful place to be if you can find a partnership like that because you will absolutely grow together. But you, you know, you got to also add this part, Adam. Is that uh, you know, like you know, my parents have been married for forty plus years. Years, my grandparents before they passed away much longer you go through seasons where it's you're given all, you're given all and they're not able to give you more for whatever reason and when i say seasons people are like oh what is that like a couple yeah months? but you know sometimes it's, it's a few years you, sometimes Sal, it's that's, five years that's maybe. exactly right it's, yes. it's like okay part of why this business works like that okay this happens to all of us there are seasons there's periods of time when one guy 
is giving way more than the other guy. It's just, it's just, it's impossible to have an equal four-way split of distribution of responsibility right. and effort towards the business. Like, and if we measured that all the time, it would have never, it would not be where it's at today. Yeah. But because we view it like a marriage and understanding that there's this, this deeper love, connection, passion for each other and partnership that we have, it's like, okay, there's going to be times when Sal's going to be writing and thinking about a book for four hours in a day that I'm out at the lake or playing with my son that I'm not doing it, and I, and I don't have to worry that my partner's not going like, I can't believe I'm doing this and they're not doing like that. That's what makes a partnership successful. Whether you're talking about a business that you're growing to this level, or you're talking about a, a marriage and someone you've decided to do life with, there's going to be seasons when you, when you carry the burden, when you carry the load, that's what makes a good team. Yeah. Don't you wish that it was communicated more often? So I think people go into these situations with so many lies and expectations that are false. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, look, everything that we're saying, if you're listening, you're like, that's, that's not what I heard. That's not what the therapist said. That's not what I, okay, do what everybody else tells you. Do what the world tells you. You know what? 50% chance you're not going to make it. That's what the data shows. So how about try this other thing that, uh, that, that's, that, that, that seems to work. It seems to work. This is how it's been done for thousands of years. There's also the wrong attitude about serving. There's this idea that like, like again, oh, I'm going to go do these things so I get something. It's that's like, not the, that's not the yeah. same. You have to serve in an unconditional way that you and learn to want to do that. And it's called and, sacrificial. And, and if you don't want to do that, then maybe you're with the wrong person. Yeah. If you if you haven't found someone, or maybe who, you're the wrong who, person. Or yeah, what, yeah. whatever. You, you you have to find that person or be that person that wants to serve those those people in order or serve that partner mm. in order to have that successful marriage. And it's just. Yeah. I don't know. I think that I, I unfortunately I think it's been communicated so poorly uh, to our society, the, especially this generation coming up right now. And I think that's a reason why we see loneliness, depression, yeah, dude. So all these things yeah. on the rise. Yet we have more. We have more access. We have more things. We have more. We have more yeah. of everything. Yet. We are more depressed. We are more lonely. We have less friends. Like, what the fuck does it? Does that tell you we're heading down the right path? Yeah, yeah. Or does that make you go, hmm, maybe we should reevaluate the way we've been raising some of these kids and telling them how they should think. Like, it's so crazy to yeah, me that totally. we don't we don't question that. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, we have a free guide. It's the benefits of eating whole foods. This gives you a shopping list. What foods are best for proteins, fats, carbohydrates. There's recipe samples. It's all based on real, whole, natural foods and it's a free guide it's totally free you can get it if you go to wholefoodsguide.com or by clicking on the link in the description below all right i'm going to take a left here uh i'm going to mention um these better biome gummies from organifi so we're getting messages from people uh -huh. who've been using these it's it's a, an unassuming product from them designed to improve your gut microbiome you eat it before you eat anyway we're getting messages from people who are like this helped my bloating and my digestion and my inflammation. I think I asked you this last time, and I, 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 if I did, I apologize that I forgot already. Explain to me the difference between a prebiotic and a probiotic. Probiotic is the bacteria. Prebiotic is what feeds good bacteria. Okay. So you are priming your gut. So if you eat these before you eat, you prime your gut for better gut health uh, when you eat your meal. Mm -hmm. It is not adding bacteria to your gut. It's not a probiotic. It so is can you give me like a, like an example of like where one is better than the other or how I use I think it. you would use both. You would use both. Yes, you would. In okay. fact, I would do something like take this before I take a probiotic just to add some fuel or some food to the beneficial bacteria. That might be a good comment. In fact, some probiotics add a prebiotic fiber like our other partner seed. Yeah. Um, but I would, I, that this would be a good combination. Okay. Definitely. Okay. But this is something like anybody can take. With, okay. Whereas with, with probiotics, some people are sensitive to them or not. This is something most people can, can take or use. Yeah, yeah. And then speaking of food, did you guys hear that let me see. I know Fruit Loops, but I think there's some other products have been banned in California. I Why? I heard a Why? rumor about that. Like, but okay, so this is another policy that's I'm I'm confused. Like, so that's the the direction we're going. Every now? once in a while, like a broken clock, California is right. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> they've banned Fruit Loops cereal and hot Cheetos and other processed food snacks because. There's data, and we people in the wellness space have been Is this saying over this. the red dye, or yeah, exactly. Okay. So people in the in the um, wellness space have known this for a long time, and parents with sensitive children have known this for a long time. Yeah, blue, green, yellow, and red additives, certain kinds of dyes, uh, have been found to contribute to things like ADHD, and some people talk about worsening uh, autism symptoms uh, for other kids. 
But ADHD is the one that most parents are like. So we actually banned the Fruit Loops, huh? In California. Interesting. Now, here's the deal. We're just going to get the Fruit Loops that you get in Europe because they don't use all those. Those things, those dyes, by the way, have already been banned. They've been banned in Europe for a long time. If you look at the ingredients of Fruit Loops or Cheetos or Doritos in Europe versus the ones here, the dyes and preservatives are different. It's yeah. inter So it's interesting to me, what, what motivates a company that sees the writing on the wall because already another country has banned these things and they've 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 basically said hey we we think this is toxic we think this isn't good therefore you can't do this you have to and then we reformulate for that why do we not just go you know what this is probably the direction everyone's going like it yeah. doesn't take like it's it not seems rocket to be science. problematic maybe we should adjust things right? yeah uh is is it just because they have like all this inventory and yep. stock that they just like uh we they've gotta... got their supply chain so I, the cost yeah, and it's people cost like them. too much Listen, to people like them if i gave you a bowl oh, i think it's more insidious i it may be i think but, like there's more like addictive properties to the dyes and things well like i was that, just gonna that, say yeah, if i if right? i put a bowl of american fruit loops in front of you and a bowl of you know, German Fruit Loops or whatever in front the of you. The color's different, dude. One One's of them brighter. looks more vibrant yes. and one of them tastes so that's, a little sweet. So that's my theory. Uh -huh. My theory is more yeah. insidious. It's more, we know, we have the data the to show yeah. that people uh, are, are more addicted to the California Fruit Loops than they are the you know European ones. Right. So we're going to ride that train until we can't anymore and then we'll change. Because to right. me, it makes just market sense. Like, listen, the market is moving in this direction. Nobody, nobody who runs these massive companies isn't aware of- they know. No. We're more health conscious. We're moving that direction. So then, and you've already had to pivot for one thing. So you can you can start to mold your mm -hmm. supply chain to look like that. So that doesn't make sense right. to me. The only thing that makes sense to me is like we actually know that it's more profitable. There's a benefit there. Yes, there's monetary. a benefit there for us to keep feeding this bullshit that we know is unhealthy, but we know it's more addictive okay. and better sales. Well, do you guys see the U.S. Uh, district court? ruling that uh, they, they actually acknowledged uh, the fact that it was problematic with the fluoride in the water yeah. for kids yep. IQ no 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 it is this is this is they like ruled that, groundbreaking. that fluoride in water lowers IQ <sighs> Yeah, which we've known. Can I but say, no, no, we haven't known. Conspiracy theory. Yeah, that's well, say, that's a, it's been okay. a conspiracy thing forever. Forever. Sure. Forever. Okay, we haven't. But this it, has the last it's five. Been speculated. Bro, the last upon. five years has to be like this. Must be the decade of conspiracy theorists. Like, they have to, <laughs> we, you know, we're at a. Point, They're winning. By the way, I don't know who, who's going to do this first, but some there is a book ready for somebody. That's like everything that was a conspiracy, conspiracy theory that's that been were proven. It's yeah. a checklist. Like check off. There is. Like, this one. There's a whole book came now. To fruition. Really? This one came to fruition. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Diddy. Boom. <laughs> oh yeah, go to your oh, shit. go to your yeah. dentist. They still want to give your kid fluoride. They still want to use fluoride toothpaste. And I've been avoiding those for a long time because I, I you know, I'm in the health space. Yeah, so we look did. at we that. Did, yeah, for a long. Yeah. Time. By the way, have you guys ever noticed? Have you guys noticed any differences with dyes? Have you played with them to see how your kids react with, at all? I know I mean, you guys. I'm kind of stay past with. the you know the um, that kind of. I mean, you, stuff, you guys avoid but, processed foods. Beyond. Yeah. yeah I mean, so it, we noticed something with okay. our kids and it wasn't because of processed foods. Cause we rarely, I don't think we ever buy. No, we never buy foods that are processed like this. Never. If they have it, if they ever had it, it would probably be like a birthday party or something. Um, but then at that, at the, in a birthday party, it's hard to decipher. Is it the sugar? The sugar or is it the crazy hat, right? But no, we saw this with our kids when they were sick because we gave them Tylenol that had red dye in it. Really? So we gave them so you know they get a fever and it's hard for them to sleep and so typically if you bring the fever down a little bit they'll sleep better, and we gave it to our our kids and they were my daughter was hyper for three hours, bouncing off the wall acting silly and goofy and I'm like what is going huh. on with her and I thought it was the Tylenol at first, and then it dawned on me I'm like let's try the dye free Tylenol sure enough totally fine I didn't even know they had wow. red dye in Tylenol. I didn't either oh, so they have the children's one that's yeah. like you know it's like flavored yeah you can get it dye free. Or you can get the traditional one that's red. You know like what's red. funny? Like, Ethan has been obsessed over this whole like red dye thing. I think there's been like a big movement. And, and two, they watch videos like so, like some of these like YouTube shorts where they they kind of expose some things like the little um, the mites and things when they when they zoom in. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. You know, like he gets really into and so like red dye. He kept like stressing this to me. He's like, Dad, it's like so bad for you. I'm like, ah, really? They don't <laughs> look into that. You know, like I just thought it was another like TikTok. Yeah, thing. the other part of it too that I hate. It's going to be sad to say, but I think the reason why they also got away with this for so long is it's hot Cheetos and Fruit Loops. So, like, if you're feeding your kids this stuff all the time, uh, yeah, it's like 
you might not be paying attention. No, the, those are to, not good. To the dyes. Nutritionists. Yeah. <laughs> Nutrition you know what I'm saying? You're probably not paying attention to dye. Yeah. If you're not paying attention to the fact like, you could give my kid hot Cheetos with natural, you know, coloring. I'm not going to let them eat it either. <laughs> you yeah, know right. Yes. So, you know, I think that's, and it makes me sad because that's a, that's a category yeah. of people are already getting messed with. So I, I wonder. On top of it, throw this shit on top of it. Yeah, I wonder yeah, too, totally. if this, does that even help or solve anything, right? To that, to your point right there, like the same parents that allow the kids to eat that, like it's probably not even the top. Like you're probably, we're probably more concerned about child child uh, diabetes than we are freaking yeah. Yeah. the red dye that's in there. Because it's like, if they're eating that type of stuff and they're a kid, God knows what the rest of their, yeah. their diet is. By the way, like this too. was a movement that was pushed by schools because mm. the schools were or the parents and the teachers were like these kids come in from lunch eating this stuff and they are crazy and they're noticing a difference when they take it out that's interesting that they Have connected heard- to that like that that's I know, wild i know but I there's, there's, there's studies on it mark bell had this guy on i don't know his name but he was talking about um like if if one of the parents was obese it was a 20 percent chance of their kid having autism oh and then also diabetes another 20 percent yeah. chance and then you combine them together and that's like 40 percent chance it, do you guys want to hear yeah. yeah yeah do you want to hear a crazy st- I, hear I, I, I wasn't aware of that i learned about a crazy ass study and it's real you can look it up uh recently about a cohort of children the only group of children we've seen recently have a dramatic decline in autism. Do you guys hear about the story? Mm-mm. So autism rates in pretty much every group been has been know, going up, 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 up. Yeah. And there's people that are like, it's this, it's that, the other. But nonetheless, it's grown quite a bit. I mean, over the last 40 or 50 years, it's grown, I don't know how many thousands of percent to the point where it was so rare in the past that uh, doctors could go their whole careers without seeing a kid with autism. Now it's like super pr- prevalent, right? There was a study done on Marin County, wealthy, white, and Asian uh, children. Okay. And it was the first time they saw today, in like today's time, a substantial drop in autism rates. Do you know what else those parents were doing? What? Remember, these are crunchy, hippie, wellnessy, wealthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. N- not vaccinating their kids. <laughs> Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's going to pour. Yeah, this is one that Robert Kennedy has been bringing up. And I'm like, is this real? I looked it up. Yeah. So one of the few studies that actually showed a group of kids oh God. reduce uh, their, their rates of autism. Now, is it I positive? the reception to that information has gotten any less like, uh, you know, because before that, you say something like that and it's like, ah, like, know. there's a lot of uh, pushback on that. Part of the reason I think there's pushback, is, and I'm not saying it's causative, by the way. So the, date, the study didn't say it caused autism. It's just there's one cor- of the factors that was different. Yeah, there's, a right. there's a correlation. And because so many there's so many people who've been raising the alarm on this, Robert Kennedy being one of them, uh-huh. saying something with the vaccines is connected to autism, that makes my ears uh, kind of perk up. But part of the reason why, besides, you know, we go big pharma and their lobbyists and their connection to the government, all that stuff. Besides all that, I saw this during COVID. When you're a parent and you make your kid do something, like wear a mask all day long at school, and then other Parents come and bring you data and say, hey, that's not good for your kids. It's not going to help them with their speech and develop. You're in cognitive dissonance because you don't want to think of yourself as someone that would hurt yeah, your that, kid. Yeah, because you're not doing it for that intent. You're not. Yeah. You're not oh, my God. You don't want to hit my kid. So yeah. now you're defending it. That's, the, same, that's, defending that's without, the vaccine yeah. argument. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. It's like pa- parents are, do, you know, how, how dare you say that? Like, I'm trying to harm my kid. That's yeah. what they, they interpret that sure. as. So nobody wants to hear that. No, no, no. Anyway. Wow. So, yeah, Speaking of brands and stuff like that, Adam, you were bringing up Plunge and talking about their brilliant. Oh man, I t- I actually so Katrina and I are on our our calls for uh, for next year, right? So this is the time of the year where we start to uh, lock in contracts for next year for partners and stuff like that. And uh, I had just told her recently that I said, hey, when you when you talk to Plunge, I want to talk to them because. I'm just, I, I get really interested in our partners that I see doing really, really cool stuff. I've shared th- different things that our partners are doing. Um, but there's no doubt in my mind that Plunge uh, will be the most dominant cold plunge in, in the industry by far. They're just, they're, whoever they hired on their, their marketing team are just doing really cool, brilliant stuff. One of the things was, did you, you saw that they partnered with one of our old partners, Liquid Death. Yeah. Uh-huh. So they did a thing to, so they did this collab where they basically made the plunge look like a Liquid Death uh, thing. Can. Yep, a uh, can. And so that was really brilliant. They just did the thing uh, with uh, Diplo Runs, who's a famous DJ. 
that gets all these people together and do these massive uh, runs. And they partnered, they could, did a collab with him. So mm. he comes out, he does the whole run with them. He cold plunges afterwards and he puts on a concert. Oh, and so these cool. are going like mainstream, crazy, oh, wild. Wow, that's so it's so smart because it's it's bringing, uh, it's it's introducing people that like typically say uh, 15 years ago or more, uh, marathon runners were, you know, if you ran a 5K, 10K or a marathon, you're a hardcore runner. Like, yeah. you know, it's more of a competitive sport for you where it's become more of like, and, and we saw the introduction of things like Muddy Buddy and Spartan yeah. Race. It's now like becoming- a social thing? Yeah, it's becoming more of a social fun thing. I'm not like- Less intense of a Yeah, I'm not like worried about yeah. my time being shaved yeah. by two minutes. I, I'm there. It's a healthy, good, positive thing that other like-minded people can do. And people like Diplo Plunge have tapped into this uh, from a marketing perspective. And I think it's so brilliant. And what it's doing is it's bringing- and introducing a whole bunch of people that may not have met or seen these brands uh, into, and Plunge is just absolutely crushing it. And they're also, I don't know the last time you guys looked, but their line is, has grown extensively oh, too. Oh yeah, they like have the, like the Cadillac oh, versions yeah. and they yeah. have the ones that you can yeah, fill up Which yourself. was brilliant because when they first launched, they had just a real high end, like it was, it kind of like left- filtered. Yeah, and they give you a lot of options. Yeah, you kind of like, looked at it like, Jesus, man, if unless I, I got some good money, I don't know if I can afford this, you know, $7,000 plunge, but now they've got stuff for super reasonable. Yeah. So if you're like, I want the benefits of that, but then I, but I can't afford a $7,000, you know, Cadillac's plunge, they've got that. So they have kind yeah. of like every level and stage. And so no, they've been uh, they've been fun to watch. Did you man. guys you guys when you guys were training people, did you guys ever train I know you guys train marathon runners, but did you ever go to a marathon to support uh any of the runs or anything like that? Have you ever been to one? Uh, I I'm not sure that I actually went to the event, but uh, I I've had you know, a few clients that do that and the triathlon. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, I, I guess I was there at the end. I didn't watch. It, so, <laughs> so I showed up. I had I one like, of yeah. the most profound experiences at a, Mar I, you know, I've, I never ran. I'm not a marathon runner. Running was never my thing, but I trained a young woman for a marathon and it was a, uh, I believe it was a breast cancer awareness mm -hmm. one. I believe they were, it was for, it was for a, a charity and she wasn't like this hardcore runner. But she wanted to do it because, um, you know, someone she knew had, had, you know, battled breast cancer. So I trained her and then she wanted me there. So I went there and it was one of the most incredible things I'd ever been to in my entire life. The, the, the vibe and the energy, I think it was because it was for a charity. You had so many people there who had been, uh -huh. who had been, uh, it's like an emotional release. Uh -huh. Dude, they had been touched by cancer or affected. I remember, I'll never forget this. It gets me emotional thinking about it. As I'm watching the race, this the you know, and and my client ran through and she won and we, we were congratulated and I wanted to hang out longer because I was so like, remember this woman? I mean, it was like she definitely wasn't a runner, but she was pushing herself and she's coming at the end and she's dragging her feet and on her shirt she's got a picture of a young woman who must have been a friend of hers who died from cancer. It's like oh, this is for you man. and she was just crying and pushing the, and everybody's crying. I'm like, oh, what God. the? This oh. is the most amazing thing I've ever oh, seen. God. And that was, uh, I mean, just for me, it's like I had a new respect for, you know, some of these, some of these types of events. I know. I think yeah. the, I, you guys have to look it's at the, the, I don't know if Doug can pull up like a picture, an example of the, the Diplo runs, but it's pretty cool to see. I'm, I'm so creative. I always love when I see a brand think of something I'm like, God, why didn't I think of that? Or why you know, wouldn't like the, what isn't a this like a trend right now where there's running clubs, but they're really, they're for single people and they <laughs> meet other people. Yeah. 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 That's like so that trend. was a stat that, um, our friend Chris Williamson brought up with I forget who he was interviewing. Who he was I think talking. that's a great way to meet. And he made that he made that as a, I don't know if it was him or his guest. I can't remember who said that. Many people use that as a way of dating because you're 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 going to find people you have stuff in common with. You have this like kind of informal way. Yeah, because you're doing something. We're not yeah, just here to yeah, date. Yeah, we're not here yeah. to date or meet each other. We're here for the run club. But it's mm -hmm. like you're you're there also to put it. Oh, so here's the the, the diplo run. Oh, cool. Um, I wonder, do they have a lifting club for people to meet other people? I feel like that would be a great way to meet people. I mean, as well. it makes, I tell you what, it makes my uh, my sure. wheel spin. Yeah, you know, these aren't like the whole concert great picture. It's not the best one. Yeah, it looks like a lot of fun. Yeah. Did you guys ever do the, what was that run in San Francisco where you run and then you go to different bars? Oh, uh, yeah. 
You know what I'm talking about? Of, yeah, yeah, I do. So there's a there's a run in San Francisco that they do that is at every marker there there's a cooler of alcohol and you. I think uh, that's the one I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, they do. They, it's that, that's oh, like, there's always a naked guy. I there's I, I, one, I had a good friend of mine that used to, do, <laughs> used to meet up and do do those. They're all like that though. Like as far as like that's kind of like what I'm talking about. Those type of runs where people are using those to meet and yeah. and, and meet people and stuff. I think that's really I think that's really cool. All right, yeah. I got one study to put, put, to to talk about real quick here towards the end. I thought it was a really cool study. They did a study on uh, strength gains in the elderly, and they found that 85 plus, so 85 year olds, even people in their 90s, uh, can build muscle just as fast as people who are 65 to 75. What? So they build muscle just as fast. Now, I think the potential is different. You're not going to build as much muscle later, but the rate at which you build muscle. When you're 85 is like it was when you were 65 or 70 I really, years old. I'm, and I've seen this. I'm not a fan late. of these studies that talk about age. I just think that if you take a group of people and you're not controlling much variables other than these people are this age, it does not tell the story about what strength training and diet yeah, can potentially do. experience and lifestyle. It's so irrelevant. I, I can't tell you how many people I've trained uh, late in their life, 60, 70, even as high as 80, and have said to me, Adam, I'm in the best shape of my life at this age. So it doesn't, like, the reason why we have things that say uh, it gets more difficult as you age, because on average, people's hormone levels go down, their mm -hmm. ability, like, all these factors that play a role in your ability to build muscle, burn body fat, start happening as we age, but a lot of those things that start happening as we age, because yeah. we don't take care of and do There's things. There's a big part like the of epigenetic that factors all stacked yeah, up. Yeah, it has like, you know, way less point. to do with age than it does. Well, speaking of strength, because it's really strength that you want, especially as you get older, this study on strength and its predictor of all-cause mortality, and they use grip strength because that's just a, a proxy for overall body strength. Nothing specific about the grip. It's just if you're strong grip, you're probably stronger everywhere else. And what they found was the weakest quarter of individuals. So when they look at the groups of strongest, next strongest, next strongest, and then the you know the weakest, right? The, the weakest quartile of individuals were more than twice as likely to die in the next 10 years. 10 yeah. years. Wow. Yeah. So... I think at some point they're going to use, because the data on this is just too strong. I think at some point insurance companies are going to use a grip strength test. I think yeah. they're going to bring a, a, a dynamometer or whatever. You'd be silly not to. Yeah. I mean, if you, I mean, because you'd be way more like, if you know that stat. Yeah, and you know, good blood markers, well, everything else looks good. Here, squeeze this. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Let's say when you break good. a hip, it's a good death sentence. Yeah. 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 <laughs> No, I seriously. So. I, I think that's, I think that's, I think for sure. Uh, shout out today. I got one. Um, I shared it with Darren. Uh, Darren is the one who writes our newsletter. If you guys don't uh, subscribe to our newsletter, he is incredible. He's hilarious. He's smart. Um, absolutely love the way he writes. And I shared with him to give him topic ideas, this guy I just found on Instagram. And I love finding people like this that are still small, uh, relatively small, and, and then giving them love. So let's see if we can blow this guy's page up. So uh, his name's Jake Han, uh, and that's his actual Instagram handle, all one. So Jake, then H E Y E N, all one word. And he does all fitness news. So it's like literally what's oh, happening cool. in fitness this week. So, like, the topics I actually oh, had wow. to bring up today, which I didn't bring up. Uh, came from from his page like he's constantly posting uh updates on like what's happening so if you like here and that's oh, everything that's from cool. like gyms to brands to collaborations to gym chains like you name it like he drops like fitness news mm. uh constantly so pretty cool instagram page to follow element it is an electrolyte powder it's high in sodium it's high enough in sodium in fact most electrolyte powers don't have enough that is not artificially flavored. Uh, there's no artificial sweeteners. There's also no sugar. It just tastes real good. And it gives you the electrolytes you need for better workouts, for better sleep, better pumps, especially if you're on a ketogenic diet or you don't eat a diet that's high in high, heavily processed foods. This can be a game changer. Anyway, go to their link. Go to drinklmnt.com forward slash mind pump. You'll get a free sample pack on that link with any drink mix purchase. All right, back to the show. Our first caller is Brandon from Hawaii. Brandon, what's up, man? What's up, buddy? What's going on? Hey, how's it going, guys? Thanks so much for having me you got it. and answering my question. Uh, first off, wanted to start off by saying I'm a huge fan. I've been listening probably for about four or five months now. Um, super thankful for the content you guys put out regarding health and fitness and also just your experiences into fatherhood. 
Um, I'm 27 years old, uh, 5'11", weighing in currently at about 263. I played a lot of sports growing up as a kid, was always into weightlifting. Uh, I'm from Monterey, California originally, and uh, started going to the Monterey Sports Center, lift to lift weights when I was about 12. Um, I've been through all the diets, uh, vegan, keto, intermittent fasting. I've always been kind of fit, kind of fat my whole life and struggled to lose weight. Being taught uh, at a young age, basically my whole life, to work hard in and out of the gym, always strive to be the hardest worker in the room. Um, growing up, I've always wanted to, I was always told to eat low fat diets and that uh, eating a lot of red meat and stuff was bad for you, as many were told. Um, I've gained and lost over 80 pounds twice in my life from running, lots of weightlifting, restricting calories. After the second time I gained all the weight back, I hired a personal trainer. I was intrigued by the trainer because the first day I met him, uh, he actually fixed some shoulder pain I was having during a bench uh, from a priming movement he taught me. And after meeting with him uh, about two months later, you know, I realized it wasn't really what I was getting out of what I wanted to get out of the trainer, which was just proper form and getting back into strength training side of things, um, trying to learn a squat. But my trainer was constantly making me run due to Bata style workouts, which were not really fun at all for me. Uh, I've done a lot of exercise like this throughout my life and just knew this wasn't the route I really wanted to go down again. And he restricted me to 1500 calories, told me not to eat more than 50 grams of fat a day. So luckily my coworker, um, shout out to Joseph, uh, showed me this podcast the same week I was going through this trainer experience. And after a week of listening to you guys, I heard Sal say I didn't have to hate my workouts and dropped the trainer and stopped running and didn't do a lot of uh, low rep work growing up. And I always kind of stayed in the eight to 12 range. But the lower up phases and anabolic one are currently my favorite. Um, now that I've headed down this path with you guys, I tr I was tracking my macros fairly consistently when I got sent this question in and did a reverse diet, noticed sizable gains in the gym, got my strength back where it was before the crash diets after running anabolic about four or five times now. Um, I noticed my energy and overall feeling just felt really good when I was eating a higher fat diet. My carbs weren't as high on a regular basis when I was tracking regularly. Um, some days I had more carbs than others, but noticed that I consistently and naturally just ate higher fat diet. I still have a lot of fat. I would like to lose probably like 50, 40 pounds. If I were to guess, I'd say I'm low, uh, high 20, low 30% body fat. It's easier for me to eat a higher fat diet. And I know it's important for consistency that I enjoy what I'm doing, but will eating a higher fat intake mess with my overall effectiveness of a cut. Um, I still have everything I've kind of been told in the back of my mind growing up and it almost feels wrong to be doing what I'm doing. Sometimes I'll get home from the gym, I'll sit down, eat a New York steak with six eggs. In the back of my mind, I'm kind of doubting myself and what I'm doing and seeing if it's actually okay. So currently, sometimes um, I'll be eating anywhere between 140 to 250 grams of fat, 200 to 250 grams of protein, and 120 to 180 grams of carbs, with about 3,200 calories-ish being my maintenance. 90% uh, of my diet being whole foods and adding or averaging about 10 to 12,000 steps a day. Right now, I've stopped tracking to try to do it on my own, mainly focus on protein, whole foods, uh, like you guys say, I'm getting slightly stronger each week, but my weight has been fluctuating really from 263 to 267 for about two to three weeks now. Uh, I only uh, go on the scale like once a week, but um, I feel like I'm stalling out with fat loss ever since I stopped tracking. I'm not sure if this is due to my high fat intake or if it's just because I've stopped tracking and probably eating more around my maintenance um, like right automatically naturally. Um, I'm also wondering if I focus more on low rep heavy what rate uh, excuse me low rep heavy weight training while actually um, well eating this way well if it's good to good approach for my fat loss goals. All right. Brandon, you are killing it, yeah, bro. Yeah, you're doing a good job. Yeah. You understand that you went from eating 1,500 calories to bada style type of workouts to eating 3,000 calories, getting stronger, building muscle, and it sounds like your weight's kind of hovering the same. You're not really gaining. You're not really losing. You're kind of... Bro, yeah, you are you are spot. more than winning there, right now. There's a lot here. First off, your trainer was terrible, so you did yeah. a great job uh, getting rid of him. That that was the absolute wrong approach. Worst advice ever. Worst. You're, the question around fat uh, and fat gain, uh, or you know the macronutrient fat and fat gain. You gain body fat when you eat more calories than you burn. Okay, that's it. So it can you can gain body fat from any macronutrient now. It gets a little bit more granular when you kind of boil it down to like the thermic effect of each macronutrient. So protein being the least likely to cause fat gain, mainly because the utilization of protein burns more calories than the utilization of fats or carbohydrates. But, you know, we're kind of splitting hairs there. 
you're eating a high protein diet. It doesn't matter if your fat is high or if your carbs are low. In fact, you can go zero carbs and that's okay. Although for most people, it's better to have a little bit of carbs. If you want to get leaner, you're just going to have to cut your calories a bit. Your, your strength training is great. The only advice I would give you with strength training is because you've run MAPS Anabolic four or five times in a row, we probably want to interrupt it with something that's going to train you. Yeah, like uh, you performance. Stimulus, yeah, yeah, unilaterally or, or, or with lateral and rotational movements because MAPS Anabolic is so uh, focused in one plane of movement. And so I'd be afraid that you might get an injury at some point. So MAPS Performance or MAPS Symmetry would be a great workout for you to follow. Um, there's nothing wrong with low rep training, except your body will plateau if you stay there for too long. Now you can stay there for six weeks, seven weeks, but you, you're going to want to move out for a few weeks just to keep yourself, uh, from plateauing. But otherwise, I mean, strength training gets stronger, whole food diet. That's what you're doing. You're eating high protein. That's perfect. Uh, you're just, you're probably eating at maintenance, although it's only been a couple weeks. So I wouldn't judge it after a couple weeks. I'd wait another two weeks to see what's going on. And if after two weeks you see yourself getting leaner, then stay, stay the course. If it's still kind of plateauing and you still want to see some, you want to see a little more fat loss, I would track a little bit and then cut your calories by three to 400 or so, and then just stay right there. You're, you're, it's, it's worth it where you're at, uh, at the point you're at right now to go get your body fat tested because I think you're in a really good place. Yeah. And, Cause you could be getting leaner and building muscle. Yeah. So I would go get your body fat tested. So we have kind of a, like a, a baseline of where you're currently at, at the calorie intake, how you're currently doing. And then uh, to what Sal kind of said, I'd probably pull back 500 calories. I'd only do that though for about three to four weeks and then go test again to see if that's serving you. Because I actually think where you're at is you're kind of in this like sweet spot of, Eating three thousand calories, you're probably building muscle and losing body fat. Are you by chance following the docu series I'm doing right now on YouTube? Um, I haven't been yet, no. bro. Watch that because a lot of what you're talking about right now uh, and what I'm doing, I'm trying to stay the same weight yet lose body fat and build muscle. What we call the Goldilocks zone, and I, psychologically, it's hard. It's difficult because you don't see the scale really moving. You're putting this work in. You're making all these good food choices. But yet, uh, you know, but I'm seeing the things that are matter that matter that you've said already is I see strength going up, you know, my weight's not fluctuating way high. Like I feel good, like the way I'm eating my energy, like all and like those things are all very positive indicators that you're probably in a really good place right now. And, you know, maybe I would let you cut for 500 calories for a couple of weeks just to see, but I think you're at a really good place. Sweet. Thank you guys. Yeah. The only problem I've had recently with like cutting was well, I'm, I don't like being hungry. So, um, that's, that's a big, big problem for me with cutting is, I mean, I'm always hungry, so I'm trying to just be comfortable and just be, enjoy what I'm doing so I can kind of do this for yeah. longer. Yeah. I mean, I've done this before and I know that the running and all that, it didn't last very long. So, um, yeah, thank Brent, you guys. I appreciate you, Brandon, I got you know just one comment on that. Okay, now there's, there's a difference between being starving and hungry all the time, and having hunger um, or having some hunger when you're in a calorie deficit. Um, it's like feeling sad or tired or unmotivated. Like these are all natural feelings, and if you run from natural feelings, you're gonna be in trouble. If you're so afraid of hunger or it bothers you so much that you never want to feel hunger, you're gonna be screwed. Okay, so yeah. so you, you're going to feel that sometimes. That's a normal, natural feeling. So my advice to you is get comfortable with the occasional feeling of hunger when you're in a calorie deficit. And how do we do that? We sit with it. We sit with it. We sit, I feel hungry. Don't deny it. Don't run from it. Like, yeah, I'm hungry. I'm burning body fat. Like, this is what it feels like, and you're going to be okay. Now, again, this is different than starving yourself, yeah. but if, if, you're, if you're afraid of hunger, and this is what happens, so the world has taught us to be so afraid of hunger that we sell diets that way. Never feel hungry again and lose fit. Never feel as if it's a it's not a natural feeling. It exists for a reason. You're supposed to feel hungry sometimes, and that's totally okay. So get comfortable with that feeling. Um, otherwise, you're going to struggle. It's always going to be a struggle for you. To that point, have you ever attempted or done like a 24-hour fast? No, I was just thinking that in the back of my head because I've watched so many episodes, but I was like, yeah, maybe I should try fast. Um, I mean, I've done intermittent fasting and I've done like 20 hour fasts like on the regular before, but it's been a long time. So maybe I should try to incorporate that just so I can 
feel those feelings again. Yes. Kinda. Yeah, just for the psychological benefits of that, for sure. Yeah, yeah not, not for the fat loss. Yeah, no, just no. For, just yeah, to exactly. feel the hunger and sit with it. That's the only reason yeah, I bring okay. that up. I, I like that. I like the idea of doing that every once in a while, right? This does. I don't want this to become like a regular thing. This or is switch. not your diet. Yeah, it's yeah. not a diet. It's like, hey, you know what? I, I, I should get comfortable. Here's, you know, one of the things I used to tell my clients mm-hmm. to help them with uh, that feeling is, man, that's actually a really good feeling. That is your body switching energy systems. So when you're filled up with all kinds of carbs and food and calories, your body is running off that those calories. And then all of a sudden when the body realizes, oh, wow, we don't have as extra of those calories, it switches over for fat as fuel. So that feeling is what you're feeling. That feeling of, oh, I'm starting to get a little hungry. It's like, oh, my body just switched over. It's no longer utilizing the carbohydrates and calories I had. Now it's switching over to body fat to propel me through the next couple hours. And so use yeah. that as motivation of like, okay, that's, that's a good thing. I'm sitting on the couch right now and my body's burning body fat. Yeah, like, that's a good place I, to be. I like Justin's suggestion of an occasional fast too. Again, it's not because of the, don't use it as a diet because then you'll be doing it wrong and it's, it's not going to serve you. But hunger, there's different ways that we perceive hunger. One of them is we enjoy the feeling of eating so much that not eating to us may feel like hunger. Then there's also cravings. Cravings are not hunger. And then there's real hunger, which a fast will show you, right? You don't eat for a day or two. You'll start to feel cravings. You'll feel bored. I want to eat. And then you'll feel real hunger. And it's a different feeling. And it, and, and it can be, if you use it properly, you can start to differentiate them. Because mm-hmm. sometimes what people feel is hunger is not hunger. It's just expectation. Like, oh, it's noon. Yeah, boy. I'm hungry. Well, you're just, maybe you're just, you expect to eat at noon, right? Or, oh, I want to eat something. Well, maybe it's just because you're stressed. Or maybe you just enjoy the feeling of eating so much that you just want to, you want to feel that again. So it, the fast in that context can be helpful. I do want you to know, though, bro, you're doing a really good job. Yeah, you're all, dude, yeah. You're to be right. A, to be able to go from Tabata-style workouts and 1,500 calories to 3,000 calories a day and not be putting on body fat every yeah, minute. That's a huge win. That's a huge win. I mean, what you're doing metabolically right now is incredible. And so, and you probably could just kind of hang out here for a very long, and you'll just slowly lean out. I mean, it's a, and you're, you won't feel like you're cutting really hard. You won't, you know what I'm saying? You're not really pushing the body. You're just... Letting it do its thing. If you're make, if you're good at making good choices, when you get hungry, you eat whole foods and you eat protein first, you're going to be okay. And your strength training, you're going to be okay. And I think the best thing we can do right now is uh, the original advice that we started this call is put you over into performance. So do you have mass performance yet? Um, no, not yet. Um, I'll have Doug send that over perfect. to you. So Doug will send performance over to you. And Thank then, you so much. Yeah. And then I, then I want one more thing I want Doug to give you is too, is I want to put you in the private forum. So I want to I want to give you access to the private forum, and then uh, if you decide to do either one, whether you decide to throw the fast in every once in a while, love feedback and what you feel, what you notice, how you're hearing, or if you decide you're going to cut, you know, 500 calories from the diet and see how you feel, check in with us. Just let us know, and we'll help you guide you through this process. Okay, sweet. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, you guys have completely changed my whole fitness journey, and I've feel like I've been doing this for a while and I, I feel like I learned a lot when I was a kid, but um, you guys have taught me more than I have in the last like 10 years. So thank you guys so much. You guys have really changed my life. I appreciate it so much. Thank you guys. Thanks, Brandon. You got it, Brandon. Good thank luck, you. man. Take care, guys. Good work. You know, I'm glad we had that part of the conversation about uh, I don't like to feel, mm-hmm. you know, hungry. Yeah. I mean, let me, I mean, if you extend that out to other feelings, I don't like to feel sad or bored or other what you could be, uh, what could be classified as negative feelings. Mm-hmm. This is what pushes people to do things that are not great for them, right? Yeah. Never wanting to feel bad can turn into drug addiction or avoidance. Never wanting to feel hunger mm-hmm. uh, turns into obesity and a, a poor relationship or an addiction to food. And again, I want to differentiate between like actual, like These starving. Are important signals, yeah. Yeah. So, and if you go into deficit, if your body is going to turn up its hunger signal because your body doesn't want to. It doesn't want to tap into its stored energy. Just like when you're working, you don't want to tap into your savings. Like, oh, honey, we're tapping into our savings. Um, that's not necessarily a good thing. Your fat storage is your body's energy savings. Once it starts to tap into that, it's going to ramp up uh, to a certain degree. Hunger, hunger signals because it wants to keep that. It wants to keep that insurance. So it's a normal feeling. One of my favorite things to do with a client that has reached this place because he's in a really good place just to show them like, hey, we are in the right place. Yeah. We're doing the right things is next two weeks, I'm going to cut you a thousand calories. Show so what happens. I'm, go down, I'm going to put you down at 2,000 something calories, real low. 
just for two weeks, watch what happened, and yeah. watch his body start to drop in that, and then go, okay, now that was just for oh, me cool. to show you, it. yeah, what we've done. We've moved your metabolism up so good that you could eat 500 more calories than what you were doing with all that Tabata bullshit, and you're actually leaning out. Yeah. So, like, let's go back to that. Let's keep building. Let's keep building and, that metabolism. one more comment on that, you know, if, you're a, if you have a trainer, and if your specific goal is lots of athletic endurance and stamina, then these kind of workouts are okay. If that's not your goal and your trainer is beating the crap out of you with Tabata, circuits, boot camp, fire them immediately. Send them this video. Say, Sal said to fire you and go find someone else because they're a shitty trainer. Boom. <laughs> Our next caller is Jenny from New Hampshire. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Hello, hello. How are you? I cannot believe I'm talking to you guys right now. This is crazy. I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Oh, my God. I've been... Um, following you guys since 2015 whoa uh, isn't i know right like yeah. almost 10 years since the early days wow. <laughs> definitely so our I, people definitely our people yeah. if you stuck with us that long yeah we love you that's right that's right so i was competing in mpc back then um and following your success so i credit a lot of my personal success and health to you guys so thank you um it's really a privilege to meet you and chat with you personally um, so I'll preface my question too um, with one change since I wrote it in, which is now that I'm five months pregnant. So I'm thrilled. Oh, congratulations! congratulations. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that this will change the answer very much, so much as enhance it or actually make it easier. But um, I reached out because I'm someone who enjoys a lot of different activities, like hiking, skiing, golfing, obviously lifting taekwondo, um, cycling, just to name a few. Um, but I also like to be very competent and proficient at those things because it's a lot less fun when you suck. So among those, um, my top two favorites or the things that I spend my most time, uh, most time doing is probably taekwondo and skiing, taekwondo being all year round and skiing, obviously being seasonal. My overarching goal and even more so now in pregnancy, um, is building my muscle back up. So I have a great foundation from a few years of bodybuilding training, running programs sporadically over the last eight years or so since I stopped competing, but it's definitely been a few since I've lifted consistently and I really miss feeling strong. Um, other lifestyle factors that play a role are traveling for work periodically. I have a tendency to overcommit socially. Husband doesn't like that. <laughs> Um, and I have two big active dogs um, and now we're growing our family. So I'm always running against the clock, sleep, nutrition, stress management, hormone health, all those things um, I, I think are in really great balance. So in summary, my challenge is finding a regimen that works for me with limited time, trying to maintain a broad skill set of physical activities. And then the bonus being something that I can follow through pregnancy and then postpartum when I'm recovered back to normal activity. Easy to, in a in a normal week. Just to look, give you a little a little bit more detail. Uh, in a normal week, because it, it sounds like you do a lot of active things. Are you? Are would you say that uh, consistently? You do you know the taekwondo and the skiing. Like, is it like three days out of the week, four days out of the week? Like, how often are you doing the other physical activities? Which I love. Yeah, yeah. So no week is normal, which is just my life. Um, I'd say Taekwondo probably again, most consistently like two to three times per week okay. um, in the evenings and then skiing being seasonal, but we go, you know, we go cross country, we go not cross country skiing, but across the country. So we come to the West coast, we go to Canada, we've been to France. So we, we, th I think of ourselves as like more intermediate to advanced skiers. So being conditioned for the, for that is quite important. Um, and the other things are really just sprinkled in, but I like to be able to hop on, a bike and go for a 15 mile bike ride, <clears throat> excuse me, without like feeling like I'm like totally not fit for it. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. I got the this perfect is, program for this you. Is easy. Yeah. Ma Maps 15 advanced version. That's it. Easy. And you can follow that right now. And with your muscle memory, Jenny, you're going to get, uh, you'll be great. And what you don't want to do while you're pregnant is chase uh, or get obsessed with PRs. You don't want to do that because, uh, mainly because I know the obvious, okay, I'm pregnant. I got a baby, I'll, you know, but really what it is, if you boil it down, is you have changing muscle recruitment patterns that are happening, in particular, that your core musculature and your pelvic floor. And there's a lot of reasons why that, that changes. One of them is the growing baby, but you also have changing hormones, your joints, your mobility is going to change. So what you don't want to do, especially, especially someone like you with so much muscle memory from all of your training, because you'll build muscle fast, don't go crazy with trying to get uh, super strong in the gym. 
be very controlled, very methodical. The muscle will come. And then the muscle is hyper-protective postpartum. That's like the most protective thing you can do is to have some good strength and good muscle, good mitochondrial density, because postpartum, you're probably not going to do a lot of exercise uh, for a little while. And then, you know, it's it's a good six months to a year before your sleep gets back to normal, the whole thing. I'm sure you heard all the, all the horror stories. So I would go MAPS 15, advanced version. It's two lifts a day, and it leaves plenty of time for you to do all the other stuff that you want to do. And it would be perfect for someone like you. And it incorporates mobility, strength, yep. and range of motion, yep. and everything that, yep. that I be looking for. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes. Especially in combination with Taekwondo and some of your other activities. But yeah, we wrote the program to be very balanced. I mean, in fact, we went through it uh, like a couple months ago, yeah. looking through the whole program. I mean, it includes rotation, there's lateral movement, there's traditional strength training. You do the advanced version, which take you about 25 minutes, would be your workout uh, time. And it's about, what is it, five days a week, six days a week? Something like that. Yeah, six. Six yeah, days a week. Yeah, six. So six days a week, you're doing you're doing two lifts a day essentially. Yep. Um, it would be per- absolutely perfect for someone like you. The, the, and like if you miss if you miss a day, I'm traveling. Not a big deal. You could right? actually. So you. So what I'll do with it because I'm following it right now is if you miss a day, you. What's nice the way we structured it is you could you could double up a day, mm-hmm. double up two days in a row. Because okay. so yeah so if and you where you're at in your fitness journey you also could get away with skipping it too yeah so you're fine you're if I, you were my client I would be more worried of us overdoing things than probably underdoing things so you might be someone who I'd say oh you're traveling don't worry about it we'll just pick up where we were and just keep going uh, but you technically could probably pair it up but I again you're such an active fit person. Um, that you probably have it. If I, you know, just from the little bit of time we've spent talking, uh, I would guess you tend to probably do more than you need than you yeah. probably don't. You the, know? the key is to understand this is what we tell people all the time. So we've all trained a lot of women uh, pre, during, and post pregnancy. Most of the work is done before. During pregnancy, you're just keeping things. Okay. You're just trying to maintain essentially is what you're trying to do. Postpartum is where a lot of people screw up, especially fitness fanatics, because you're going to feel like you could get into things and go harder than your body's actually prepared for. And uh, hip and back injuries are super common because of that changing recruitment pattern. So postpartum, I highly recommend you do some physical therapy, some pelvic floor physical therapy, and then MAPS starter. Now, someone like you is going to look at MAPS starter and you'd be like, this is so easy and basic and stupid. Trust me. Trust me, start with map starter. And then after that, you should be able to get into workouts that you're more used to. You can't go too slow. Someone like you, I would say you can't go too slow because yeah. you're not going to do nothing. Yeah. Map started a muscle mommy would be great. And then after that, muscle mommy. So you'd go right now, your 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 uh, map, map 15, 15 then, then starter, then muscle mommy would be the perfect uh, you know, follow up. Amazing. And it was um was starter uh what Katrina ran through when yep. she was pregnant too. Yep. yep. I remember you talking about that. So that's and I'm also, you, you hit the nail on the head when I, if I go into the gym and I haven't been in for a while and like, all right, well, I know what I used to be able to do before. So yep. even, even like, even going 50% of that can, can be overdoing it yep. for me. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm sore, which isn't, you know, sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's not, but in, in the case of easing back into it, it's, is, it's not. Is this your first, uh, you used to be your first child? My first, yeah. Uh, congratulations. Yeah. So, so, you know, yeah. really the challenge is also this. You're going to go into the gym and you're going to feel strong. You're going to feel good because of all the work you've done, all the right. training you've done, all that stuff. But the changes in the recruitment patterns, if we're not careful, if you're not like super careful, you'll just keep hurting yourself. Like, oh my God, I hurt my back <laughs> again. Oh my back. What's going on here? Why do I keep hurting myself? Crucially, we work on that stability. Yeah. yeah. Because they, all the, yeah. The, the, the pelvic floor muscles, the core musculature completely changes in its recruitment pattern. So when you go back to the gym, there's going to be a period of time where you have to g- regain your old recruitment patterns pre-pregnancy. Otherwise, you're left with a recruitment pattern that's ideal for pregnancy, not ideal for working out, uh, at least the way you were used to. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm already starting, like just in the last week or so, I've started to pop just a little, yeah. and I can already tell my core is like probably not where it should be, <laughs> so... <laughs> it'll be it'll be helpful immediately. I'm yes, sure. yeah, yeah, and it, it's where it should be. It's just different, yeah. you know, because things stretch out. So when muscles are stretched, they're not as strong. They're not able to fire, fire the way they're supposed to, and so your body's going to rely on other muscles to maintain stability. And then it learns that pattern. Mm-hmm. Okay, then you have the baby. Even if your tummy flattens out, which it probably will, because of your fitness background, so you're probably going to get back to okay, this is great. 
you still have the old recruitment pattern, which is going to rely, which is not ideal uh, at that point to train, at least not in a hard way. Right. Okay. All right. It all makes sense. You yeah. Got, thank you. You got it. Do you have Map Fifteen? Uh, no, I have been looking at it. Um, we'll send so it. So that'd be amazing. Thank you so much. I have a handful of other programs, but you got it. We'll get to do we'll we, get to those later on. Yeah. Do we know if you a uh, boy or girl? What do you got coming? No, we're keeping it a surprise. Oh, we, we, yeah. think, we think it's a boy, so I'll be very surprised if it's a girl. But I'm like, even if it is, she'll be a tomboy and whatever. So <laughs> I love it. She'll do all the things we do. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay, awesome. Great. All right. right on, thanks Jenny. for calling. So nice to meet you guys. Have a great rest of your day. Yes, you, you too. too. Good one. Great question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really good question. Yeah, that the the challenges with fitness during pregnancy for people who don't work out is that they play catch up. Yeah. And then the, the people- It's who, like an urgency to yes. all of a sudden get strong. Yes. Yeah. And then the people who do work out, the they overestimate uh, what they can do. That is such a common thing. I remember you talking about with Katrina. Yeah. Um, and it happened with Jessica even. It's like, well, but I feel good. Why is my back hurting? I'm like, honey, yeah. your stability is so different than it used to be. You have to treat yourself like a different body. Yeah. You got to retrain that bracing sequence all over again. She's going to do great. Hey, sorry to interrupt. It's October. MAPS Muscle Mommy is 50% off, half off. If you're interested, click on the link below. All right, back to the show. Our next caller is Curtis from the UK. What's up, Curtis? What's going on, Curtis? How can we help you? Morning, gentlemen. How you doing? Good, good, good. Good. Um, So I'll give a bit of backdrop uh, on myself, and I'll jump straight into the uh, emailing question. So um, my name's Curtis. I'm 30, turn 31 tomorrow. Um, and started when I was 17, getting into fitness, uh, to the extent that I moved around to Thailand to do a bit of uh, mixed martial arts and came back to the UK again, started running, started going to the gym. Then got into obstacle horse racing, which I know you guys are familiar with now, um, cause it's kind of taken over a little bit, made it to the world championships, got a bit further, progressed with that, um, took it quite seriously in the end. Ended up joining the army from it, um, went on to P Company, made a good career out of it, and then just slowly started falling out of fitness, as you all kind of do every once in a while. Um, but it was at that time where I fell out, I started noticing a couple of issues. I don't know if it's because I slowed my pace down, I don't know if it's um, my diet or regime change, but I started noticing a lot of internal things um, happening to me. So I went to the doctors, and after about three years, four years of in and outs, um, they diagnosed me with something called ulcerative colitis, which from listening to yourselves and reading more about it is exactly what the leaky gut syndrome is, which obviously is quite a new thing. There's not a lot about it at the minute. Um, and it's only because of yourselves that I actually found out what that was. So I've been to my doctors about it. They've kind of agreed that it's not the go-to phrase anymore, but or at the moment, but that is the symptoms are exactly the same. Now, my issue is at the minute, I'm taking everything quite seriously with the calories, with the um, programs I'm doing, which is uh, currently on MAPS Strong, still in phase one at the minute, about moving to phase two. My calories are up there. My calories are 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 sometimes. So I started on 5,000 about last year uh, when I was bulking up because I've always been quite a lean runner. My issue is with what I've got with this leaky gut syndrome, are my calories just being wasted? No, they're not being wasted. But it's not helping you. It's probably not helping you, though. So ulcerative colitis is an autoimmune issue, and it's leaky gut would be, um, in some cases, is autoimmune, but in other cases is caused by lifestyle. Ulcerative colitis um, can be um, categorized as an autoimmune issue. And I would 100%, if, if you're looking for the best results in the gym, you want to eat in a way that reduces that type of reaction. Eating a lot of calories and pushing through could cause it to get much worse, and then forget uh, forget about everything. So, I would be uh, that would be where I would focus. Um, are you familiar with the carbohydrate specific diet or some of the other diets that people with like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis have, have used? Yeah, so I've been through quite a few, but especially over my running career. Um, so I went from recently, actually a few years back, started out with carnivore diet because everyone at one point thinks that's a good idea. Uh, yeah. Came off of that, went keto, um, and have kind of played around with calories. So I found quite a lot of uh, specific foods that kind of will flare and um, not help the situation. So I cut them out completely. Beautiful. I miss a lot of them, but it is what it is. Um, uh, so I've, I've tried doing things like that. So at the moment, it's 
I mean, quite a bland diet, but equally I'm getting the calories and getting the nutrition I need. So it's all balanced out. Um, I'm hitting the protein, hitting the fat, hitting the carbs, but it's, yeah, I have taken quite a lot out. Now with the, with the foods that you're eating, uh, with your, with your diet, are you having any symptoms or do you feel symptom free at the moment? Wouldn't say symptom free. Um, certainly wouldn't say that. Haven't been symptom free in about five years, I don't think. Um, but it's a lot more controllable. Okay, good. That's good. So the other thing I would do is I would <clears throat> I would look at meal frequency. Um, longer breaks tends to help, and just the total volume of the amount of food that you eat. Now I remember that, that I'll tell you about a conversation I had with a pro bodybuilder years ago that blew my mind. So uh, Ben Pikulski, he was a giant uh, pro bodybuilder at one point. And then he, he retired. He tried to lose a bunch of muscle uh, because he wanted to be more you know more svelte or whatever. But I sat down with him and talked. We had him on the show years ago. And I said, man, you know, bodybuilders have, pro bodybuilders have just crazy genetics. He said, yeah, you know, this, that, and the other. I said, they're able to just eat so much food and absorb it all. And he looked at me and he said, no. He goes, pro bodybuilders can build a lot of muscle on little food. And it blew my mind. Like, of course, of course. You know, it's like they, their bodies are so efficient with their food and, and can, can move it to muscle so well. You know, he's a 280-pound guy. If He's not eating 10,000 calories. I know we hear stories of guys that do that. But most of these bodybuilders will eat a diet. They'll eat like 5,000 calories like you, but they're 270 pounds uh, of, of muscle. So where am I going with this? You don't necessarily need to push your – like you're already high. Your calories are high. You, didn't need, you don't need to go crazy with pushing your calories. What you, what you need to look at is your workout programming. That's where I would place my focus. I would look at my workout programming. Is it effective? Am I stronger? I would look at other factors like sleep. I would look at nutrient efficiency. Um, you may actually find that reducing your calories a little bit because it reduces some of your symptoms may actually result in more muscle gain. So now this is typically not the case with most people. You have to eat, have them eat more. But when I see someone like you already eating four or five thousand calories, I don't think we need to push more calories. No, I, don't, no. I don't think that's the answer. No, 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 definitely not. I mean, I think that's one of the things that will actually give you a little bit of relief is coming down. Are you currently doing all the OCR running stuff that you were doing before? Or have you cut all that out? No, I cut all of it out. I did um, got into ultra marathons last year and um, was supposed to do one last week actually, but I just don't. I've got out of it now. I've started with the proper programs, um, which I was always doing my own thing in the gym, but now I've done anabolic aesthetic um, performance. Now I'm on strong, about going to, well, I'll do split after. Now I'm doing them, that's my sole focus. So I've awesome. stopped all the cardio, I've stopped that. Okay, I just um, walk a lot, I'm doing a lot of steps. And your, and your sleep is oh. okay? Sleep's great, yeah. I mean, we've got a, we've got a 20 month old and a six month old, so sleep's. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay, you just threw but, a wrench um, in the yeah, whole thing. Yeah, yeah. You just yeah, threw yeah. a wrench in the Curtis, you yeah, just threw a wrench in the whole situation. thing. Yeah, so I don't, you know, strong is great. Uh, aesthetic is fine, split is fine. Uh, but they're they're all pretty high volume, strong, uh, deceptively high volume. Those those work session days will beat you up. Yeah, I think with the I have kids, so you have a six month old and a twenty month old. They're probably too much volume for your body. And considering your background in ultra marathon, marathon, MMA, you probably have a tendency to do more than you need or push your body to how what it can tolerate, not necessarily what is ideal. I bet you, I bet you, if you switch to MAPS 15, advanced version, brought the calories down a little bit, just to give your gut a little bit of a break, I bet you'd start to build muscle. Yeah. It'd be yeah. a good experiment okay. to see. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I'd love to see you yeah. on MAPS 15 and about 3,500 calories, bro. That's a, that's going to be good. And I bet you would start to see muscle gains from yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. MAPS 15. Okay, yeah. yeah, I'm back down. Um, I'm on 2,700 at the minute calories just oh. from, again, I've taken a break, so I'm supposed to run. So I could bulk that up a little bit and then, yeah, okay. quick that going. Yeah, I mean, if you're down at 2,700 to 3,000 calories, I think is a, is a safe place of, of you're getting enough nutrients, you're going to be okay, uh, and we'll pair with MAPS 15. If you don't have MAPS 15, I'll have Doug send it over to you so you got that. Yeah, and I, I, I yeah, bet, I bet, and you'll know, here's the deal, Curtis, if, if you follow it and it's right, You'll know within a week or two. You don't. You won't have to wait a month or two. You'll. You'll by the second week. You'll be like, oh, I'm stronger. Yeah. And then you know right away. This yeah, is what I'm supposed feel, to be doing. You'll feel good. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Fine. I'll give it a go. You got it, mate. We'll send right. it to you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for help. All right, you got it. All right, man. I'm glad he threw in the. I have a six month old and a twenty month old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, because I knew his background. Yeah. You know, he looked like a young man, so I didn't. I for some reason didn't think he had little kids, but he's 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 he, his background is. Overtraining, like that's your endurance athlete, ultra marathon. Like the the goal is to push your body to its limit. So you've already got that mentality, 
plus the the ulcerative colitis, which by the way will flare up with overtraining. Overtraining causes sure. inflammation yeah, for sure. sure overall, yeah. um, and you know eating that many calories. So it's like so I had a, a, an idea that he's probably it's probably programming. Mm-hmm. Once he said he had the kids, the babies. So, oh yeah, that's what's happening right now. Yeah, that let's back off. Setting it over the top. It'll be exciting to see how he, his body responds. Car- hardest part is like most people we talk about psychologically is taking somebody who's like that who can. Push the good his- news is you'll know by week two or three. Yeah, if he actually sticks to it. That's right. right. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Our next caller is Jace from Texas. Jace, what's up, man? What's going on? What's happening? Hey, folks, how's it going? Good. Good. All right. Perfect. Um, I'm sure everybody, you know, I've heard you guys for a long time and following probably about two years when I actually moved to Texas. Um, My question, I want to get right into the question. I'll say the thank yous for after, but um, I'll just read straight from it. Um, So my question was originally about bulking strength gains between programs. So I'm six foot. My weight was like 195 for about a year. Um, my body fat percentage is about 15%. I've never really calculated it using any kind of metric. Um, at that time I was about 3000 calories a day. I did, um, anabolic first, probably last summer. Then I went to symmetry after that. And I just finished old time strengths about in June. Um, the old time strength probably had the most aesthetic changes for me just cause I was doing a lot of lifting similar to anabolic before. Um, I put my, my, you know, my lifts in there. My squat was about 335, uh, deadlift 335, and bench press was 225 at the end of uh, old time. Um, so both of my questions were, you know, I was lifting more weight on an- when I first started, like when I finished anabolic, I was close to four, I was like 405 deadlift. My squat was about 380, and my bench press was probably about 250. Um, so like, do you see that, you know, the first question was after you finish different programs, do you see the, um, the weight drop like that on certain lifts, if you're, you know, changing the type of lifts that you do or like focusing different things. Um, and then the other question was, you know, I was at 3000 and I push, I was questioning about pushing the 4,000. I was struggling with 3000 at that time. Um, and then last month, just to update you guys, um, my work was like a little slower. So I was, I really focused on like just getting the calories in and my weight did go up to, I'm at 203 now. Um, Definitely saw some aesthetic changes. I started uh, anabolic advanced, um, and I saw some definitely upper body aesthetic changes. But my lifts are still about you know three thirty, three fifteen on deadlift and squat. Um, so I think my question comes. I figured out the calorie part. I just needed to push it. But do y'all see lift changes between programs? Yeah. When, yeah. Yeah, you do because uh, so strength comes from a few different places. Okay, and this I'm going to really simplify. It's more complex than this. You have your muscles' ability to contract, and bigger muscles contract harder. You have your central nervous system's ability to fire or tell your muscle fibers to fire and organize its muscles. And then there's a skill of the lift, which is kind of both of those combined. A lot of strength is skill. So if I practice, like you follow MAPS Anabolic, it's a very deadlift, squat, bench heavy program. You're practicing those lifts often. So the skill you're going to develop with them is going to contribute to your strength gains. If I stop doing those lifts, if I stop bench pressing, but let's say I do other chest exercises or I stop deadlifting, but I still do stiff legged deadlifts and other exercises, I'm still going to lose a little strength in the deadlift. Doesn't mean I'm losing development. Doesn't mean my muscles are getting smaller. I'm just not practicing the skill of that lift. So you are going to see some of that go down, especially when you start to get into the place you're at where you, you, you've been consistent with your workouts. You're pretty strong. My lifts can fluctuate 30, 40 pounds easily now. Now, when you first, first get started the first year, you typically see things go up all the time. But once you've been lifting for a while, like, you know, if I don't squat, if I don't squat for three or four weeks, it's going to go down. Even if I work my legs out and do other exercises, I'm probably going to lose a little strength in my squat because I haven't practiced it. So that's, that's what you're, what you're noticing. I mean, if you want to see that skyrocket right now, go to maps, power lift. You've done good programs already that are, are, I think, great balance all around for you with uh, symmetry and old timey. I think if you went over to Maps Powerlift, if you if you if you care about that, right? If you really want to see your bench, squat, deadlift go back up and actually probably break through to a PR, Maps Powerlift would be a great program to follow. Yeah, I've been torn. You know, it's always a strength versus a hypertrophy. You know, what I want more. And I was just surprised. Like I hear a lot of people talk like they'll do symmetry or something, and then like when they go to the five by five, they're like. You know, they hit PRs. So yeah. when I finished symmetry and I got to the five by five, I felt weaker on squat. I think like 
I don't know if it was the nervous system change like you talked about because I hadn't squatted in months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. No, that can yeah, happen. So. You're different. You're different because of your level and where you're at. That would like typically when you hear that from somebody, that's like it's somebody who's early. They on corrected in the balance. Yeah. There was a right to left discrepancy. Yeah. Um, they needed a break in that particular way of lifting. Right. But like if you're so if I took a top tier power lifter, okay, let's just say I took like a competitive power lifter, and I said all we're gonna do for the next eight weeks is unilateral training. It would be good for them, but their max lifts would go down. Yeah. Because they're not they're they're at that it level. Reinforce now. their stability, but yeah, at the same time, it would, because of the lack of the continuous repetition, it would bring it down. Now over time, yeah. so Jace, over time, those numbers will surpass your old numbers because we, you're not creating imbalances, because exactly. you're more balanced, <clears throat> you're preventing injury. So think of strength, especially when you get to the more advanced levels or higher levels, as a step ladder, not as a continual, yeah. you know, consistent growth. And this is why we jump back and forth to strength to hypertrophy. So it's good to run it completely uh, specific, just strength focused. And then kind of we can come back to the hypertrophy training after that, after you get, you know, uh, an increase in strength gains. Well, this is also why I liked uh, recommending MAPS Powerlift is because you've done good programs to get some good balance and stuff like that with the symmetry <clears throat> and then... Uh, uh, what was the other one you did? You did uh, symmetry Strong. and no, 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 symmetry old time. and old, old time. Timing. Thank you. Uh, and I'm in now advanced right now. Yeah, and then for you to go to something like a uh, uh, powerlifting, like I think you would actually probably see PRs how, in some of your lifts. How many weeks are you into anabolic yeah. advanced? So I I did a solid month with phase one, and then my work got really busy, and I kind of changed phase two around. I couldn't commit to the six days a week, so I'm doing like three days a week. So I'm basically doing like half. Time. So I'm doing like the upper body, upper, lower split, and then a half day okay. just to kind of survive. And then when I get on an easier month, I'll go back to the six days a week and I'll finish that off. Yeah. But I'm like I'm in phase two right now, but I'm still getting aesthetic changes from just that volume yeah. um, and eating more calories. Like my upper body development has, has gone up. It's just the lower body. Like I don't want to drop 315 is like where I want. I don't want to. Yeah. Lose that on my deadlift for a squat, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anabolic yeah, yeah. advanced is a little bit more hypertrophy focused than traditional anabolic. It's also less appropriate for most people. What That's you, why we wrote it as advanced. What, 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 Jace, what do you do for work that where your schedule fluctuates like that where you get so what do you do? I'm a, a surgery trainee, so uh, a surgical oncology fellow. Oh, wow. Oh, uh, long hours. I mean, what's holy the- shit. Why are you doing maps anabolic yeah. advanced? I am very familiar <laughs> with the kind well, of I had, hours. I had, an, I had an off month for, for research, so I okay, was able to okay. commit. That's why I went full blown on the calories. Just want to see if I can move the knee over, really push it, and, I, and it did. And then I'm pulling, you know, I'm still in anabolic advance, and I wanted to to do like a slower version of it, but not completely discard it. Um, Listen, but- so this is another variable that we didn't talk about. That could I'm so ab- glad you asked them. Th- yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is another variable that could absolutely have a major impact on your lifts too. I mean, you're again, you're now at this level of you're you're a strong guy, and man, when when work kicks up, stress kicks up. I got a lot on my plate. Right. Uh, Listen, it, we it'll, ab- adjust, it'll absolutely affect me. Listen, my I question. trained a lot of surgeons and I know like what the hours you put, especially as a fellow. Why don't you just let us know, <laughs> let everybody know, what do your hours look like when you're in the middle of it? Um, so I'm pretty much operating every day. Um, so most of it's standing, not actually sitting. I mean, uh, I get here at 5 a.m. and I'm going home probably at 6 p.m. And, in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> Today I actually have clinics. So it's a break, but yeah, yeah, and then every yeah. other the weekend um, rounding, and then called a few times a month in the middle of the night. Yeah, so yeah, we have in house. <laughs> All right, listen, <laughs> listen, Jace. <laughs> yeah, you need mass fifteen, homie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. bro. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I figured you guys would say that. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, yeah. The, the six days of the week are are tough because it's inconsistent. Like if I get an hour break somewhere, I'll so, go. So you can pair them. You can pair them up. So that's what's cool about MAPS 15. MAPS 15, the way we we set right. structured it. Stack them. If you if miss a day, stack, you miss a day, day. stack the stack the days. And then it's only four exercises, so it's still under under an hour of a workout. So I think and I do think that's more appropriate for you. And I actually think you're gonna be surprised on how strong you get doing just that. Mm-hmm. And you're not, you're doing oncology? Yes, yeah, it's, it's cancer surgery. Yeah, I know it's, what that is. Yeah. So holy yeah, yeah. so all right. Yeah. So you're in there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's some long days. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah All right. Yeah. Have you done one more you, year? Have you helped with the Whipple procedure yet? Yep. Oh, yeah. what is that? How long does that take? Uh, and it, well, the easier ones are you know close to five six hours. Um, longer ones can be all day. You're in there. You're not leaving, guys. 
Like you ain't yeah. leaving to go to the bathroom or nothing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's why the calories have been so difficult. Like to get 3000 in a day, it oh, was really tough. Impossible. Sometimes I'd be. Yeah. We, oh, need, yeah. we need, we, you need, you need math 15 in your arsenal. Math 15 is so your program. Bro. We're going to send yeah, it I over. Have, okay. You have, no, it. I have it. Okay. All right, there you go. Yeah, yeah. You need, you just need to, uh, you need to move into that. You probably need to live in that more often. And For then you sure. have little short, little spurts. You're, you're going to make gains off it too. Yeah. Stay in that, bro. Stay in that. I know it's tough for probably a type A personality, go getter like yeah. guy, but uh, it's probably more appropriate for you, man. Yeah, I figure you guys like I said. Uh, do I have time for one more question? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So I noticed on symmetry, I did have an imbalance. Um, it's like my left ankle is less mobile than my right, mm. uh, and I started having right hip pain with hip hinging. So mm. when that was only, I never had that before until I, like I guess I got stronger somewhere, but. Um, I notice now when I start pushing above 315, when I hip hand at the top of a deadlift, that I feel this pain like in my glute in the hip. Um, but it's not the rest of the day when I'm walking, it's totally fine. Um, same thing when I squat at the top of the squat, when I kind of, it's not really a hip hand, but when you squat up and you contract the glute, I still have the same pain. Um, and it's only when I start really working up and it'll limit like the amount of volume I can do. Um, it doesn't limit my strength, but it's just a nagging. Is it, is it the piriformis? Is it right where the piriformis muscle is? Do you know where that is? Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's not sciatic. It doesn't shoot down my leg or anything. I think it is piriformis. I just never noticed that it was. You know, I was trying to think of how during the hip hinge, with you know, how to get that pain because I know piriformis it, when it, you're like you'll have sitting you'll, on you'll have instability from right to left in your hips more more than likely if you get in a 90 90 I actually just talked about this in my docu series because what I noticed was when I was squatting when I first got back into it I had this le same thing on the left side I was noticing the hip getting tighter on just just a little bit but I could I noticed it right away and what I communicated to the 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 video or the camera I was just what's going on right now is if I don't address this, it'll exacerbate over time. Yeah. And so, and what it was, was there was a discrepancy between internal and external rotation of the hip on one side more than the other. And an easy way to tell that is if you get down in a 90, 90, and then you try and lift, yeah. you try and lift yeah. your foot up off the back of the ground on one side. And then you try what you'll notice one side, you'll be able to lift way more than the other side. And that tells so the me internal rotation, external rotation of the hips is a little off. Yes. Do and you have Prime Pro? Because that that has great hip mobility and ankle mobility stuff. I don't that. have Prime Pro, but I've been working on my ankle mobility. I, I do have some improvement, but there's still a discrepancy. Yeah. yeah. You know, like I've been doing caustic squats, and I can do it on the right side and balance completely. The left side, I'll fall backwards. All right. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll <laughs> we'll yeah. send you Prime Pro, and there's great ankle and hip mobility stuff in there that you could practice throughout the day. That'll make a difference. And, and if if you're ever feeling pain in your glute. It's and it's not uh, impossible, but it's often not the glute. It's it's far more common that it's either the hamstring insertion, or even more common the piriformis. And you don't necessarily have to feel it down your sciatica. It just feels like it's deep in your glute. You're like, what's going on? And that usually means there's a hip, there's an instability in the hip. And so the piriformis is not necessarily a strong muscle, uh, and it gets a little overloaded, especially when you're lifting a lot of weight. Do it as much as you possibly can at the bare minimum. Every single time you squat or deadlift, you got to prime with the 90-90s in the combat. Like that's just got to be your that's got to be your go to before you ever touch that barbell, and it'll it'll make a difference. Yep. Okay, I really appreciate it, guys. You got it. Um, I didn't want to thank you for all that you guys do. Not even just the strength training thing is something I'm like using on patients now, like focusing on protein. You know, trying to get strength training. Even my colleagues, you know, a lot of people have chronic back pain and poor posture from doing this job. Um, I have to give a sh actually a shout out to Justin Windmills or a lifesaver yeah. for surgery. <laughs> it's it's uh, just from, you know, a lot of people have back pain and I'm like pain free, you know, operating. So yeah. I really appreciate all you guys do. That's yeah, I great, appreciate man. what you do, man. Yeah, yeah, Thanks yeah, for exactly. helping people the way you do. Thank Keep you. Doug's going to send Prime Pro over to you, Jason. Awesome. Thank you. All right, man. Right on. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> I feel so stupid not to I, ask. Because then everything makes sense now. Yeah. <laughs> It really does. Yeah. You know? I mean, I was kind of scratching my head because that is a decent amount of weight to drop off yeah. of that. Like, it's in like, spite of the fact that yeah, he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And so I was like, because uh, what you said is right. I mean, if you, I mean, law of specificity, right? So if yeah. you're training something different and then you go back to it, of course right. you're gonna be a little bit weaker. But that was quite a bit, and I thought you know what, I wonder if this dude, and then he made the comment about like, oh, work's been good right now. And I'm like, oh, I wonder yeah, if he what has. What are you doing? Yeah, what do you do? He's <laughs> like yeah. fucking 16 hour days. Cancer surgery. <laughs> break. And, the, <laughs> and you know. That's and, not going to work in his normal schedule. And, and you know, I, I brought up one of the most challenging surgeries just to get, just to, so to put it, uh, you know, create context. When you're in surgery, you're there and you're on and it's intense, especially, especially 
cancer surgery. Like that's yeah. a that's a big deal. And a Whipple, I brought up a Whipple. No, no breaks. I had a I had a client that was a, a general surgeon, and she came in one day. Uh, the day after she performed a Whipple that took her, I think it was 11 hours. Wow. And you're not leaving. You don't On got no breaks. It's, and it's you got to take a pee, hold it. Like, so it's yes. not even just that too, because right away people think of the like, oh wow, the physical demand of standing all day. That's, that's No, no, bad. no. It's the mental stress, it's, yes, dude. It, you, mm -hmm. the, the stress of doing something like you that. You make a wrong move and it's- So, yeah. and, and you're, so your body's getting this, this high level perceived stress all day long, and mm -hmm. then you're trying to make gains. It's just, I mean- you got to back off, dude. Yep. You got to back off of those times for sure. Totally. All right. I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six-pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible. But not if you guess along the way. So we're going to talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now, there's a huge range, right, of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body.